with a better shining day. And uh, Gabriele Pallotti opens this session, which is Italian after all. And he is professor of applied linguistics at University of Morandena and Reggio. Reggio is where he's based. He's a member of the Executive Committee of the European Second Language Acquisition and uh, of the Network Second Language Acquisition and Testing in Europe. His research focuses on L2 interaction and socialization, interlanguage, morphology, methodology, and epistemology in applied linguistics, cross-cultural and, and intercultural conversation and discourse balance. You name it and you have it. Title of the, the keynote lecture he's giving is defining, measuring, and interpreting complexity. I, I would like to spend two more, two more minutes to say that since he started in, uh, he began in to be very prolific and active in the field. Um, Gabriele has a background, a, a strong background in semiology, semiotics, and uh, his mind is very sort of um, genuinely interested in combining theory, which is, I understand is the topic of his talk today, and experimental research. Gabriele. Thank you. Can you speak in this point? Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for the opportunity to share my ideas with you. Uh, as Paolo said, uh, um, yeah, I have a philosophical background and today I'm wearing my philosopher's hat, so I'm going to talk on a theoretical level. Uh, I blend uh, theoretical philosophical reflection with empirical research. So what I'll be saying today is theoretical, but uh, constantly with a constant eye on practical application because measuring, you know, defining is theoretical and measuring is very, very practical. And what I'm going to argue is that in order to measure complexity, we need to have very clear definitions. So the first part of my talk is the theoretical part, and it's about defining and measuring complexity. And I will start by telling a short story from second language acquisition research. You're probably familiar with the so-called CAF triad, complexity, accuracy, and fluency. Research in this area started in the 90s, and after some 30 years now, um, anyway, uh, learning an additional language means building a more complex, fluent, and accurate system. So that was the intuition, and the idea was to go beyond the traditional view that, uh, that saw language acquisition as just growing more accurate. So the idea is that it's not just a matter of accuracy and fluency, but there's also complexity. So interlanguage systems grow more complex over time. Fact is, this research program started in the late uh, 90s, especially with two theories put forward by Skian and Robinson, which made slightly different predictions um, as regards the, the, the relationship between complexity and uh, task complexity and linguistic complexity. According to Skian, more complex communicative tasks elicit less complex language, whereas according to Robinson, more complex communicative tasks elicit more complex language. After some 20 years of research in this area, some meta-analysis appeared and they found that the broad field had uh, reached inconclusive results. So it wasn't clear whether Skian or Robinson was right or wrong. Uh, after 10 years of uh, hypothesis testing, is Skian or Robinson right or wrong and theorizing about complexity? Some people, including myself, began asking questions. But after 20, 10, 15 years measuring complexity, what is complexity exactly? And this is funny, you know, that after measuring something, you, you start asking what you're, you've been measuring all along, right? Uh, and how can it be validly measured? So, Bultenhausen, for example, wrote 
many L2 studies that investigate complexity either do not define what they mean by this term, or when they do, they do so in general, vague, or even circular terms. And Ortega in the same year, almost every study that investigates cognitive task demands includes linguistic complexity as one of the dependent variables. On the other hand, there has been very little systematic synthesis or validation in this area. So this is the, the state of the situation. This was the state of the situation about 10 years ago. Where are we today? Well, since then, I wrote an article in 2009 to 2012, etc. Well, we pointed out some limitations of previous results. So why the field didn't make uh, enough progress? For example, there was uh, an issue of construct under representation in some areas. For example, complexity was equated with just one single measure, like the subordination ratio, which is oversimplifying the construct of course. But in other cases, there was redundancy. So different measures measuring essentially the very same dimension trait they were piled up together without, you know, any uh, any meaningfulness. Like, for example, if you calculate the subordination ratio, the number of dependent clauses, and the number of clauses per unit, you're basically measuring the same thing. And, and, and in some studies, these were reported as three measures of complexity, which doesn't make really sense. The main problem is that complexity is a polysemous term. It can mean structure, structural intricacy, or cognitive difficulty or learnability. Some slides uh, lost formatting on this computer. But anyway, so um, the point is that this attention con to construct definition, this theoretical attention is even more important nowadays with these online tools that allow one to calculate hundreds of measures of complexity. And there is a very strong temptation to just, you know, select all and click and you get scores of measures and then you go be hacking and see what is significant without really no meaningful uh, reflection on what are you are measuring and why and, and how. So that, that's why I think at the time, so at the time of computers and the automatic analysis, we also need some theoretical reflection on what we measure. Now, in the next slides, I'm going to distinguish complexity from something else, and I'm going to say that it is problematic to call complexity everything that is not accuracy or fluency. So including complexity was a step forward in the 90s because it, indeed it added an important dimension. But now we realize that complexity cannot be just one dimension. So language learning cannot be represented by just three dimensions. And what is usually called complexity, I will argue, is at least three, four other dimensions. And it's about time that we start using different terms for different phenomena. Because calling complexity everything that is not just errors and fluency, which, which in writing is hardly ever calculated. So it means that we are we are left only with two dimensions, that is accuracy and complexity. And, and, and that's two course train. So the my point is going from an assertion like everything is complex, complexity is everything, which makes complexity research so cool, which explains why complexity appears in the title of so many volumes and articles, to what, what I called in one of my articles, a simple view of linguistic complexity, that is simplifying the construct of linguistic complexity. So as I said, complexity is a polysemous term, which has at least three basic meanings. One is structural complexity, that is a formal property of text or linguistic systems or structures that has to do with the number of their elements and their relational patterns. And this is what I call complexity. This is the only uh, meaning of complexity that I think should be retained. What is uh, sometimes called cognitive complexity has to do with the processing codes. And in this case, I prefer to uh, talk about difficulty. So something having high cognitive cost demands, etc., is difficult. We have a word in the dictionary for that. So it's true that in ordinary language, we sometimes say it's complex to say, to mean something that is difficult. But given that in science and research, you want to use different terms for different ideas, I think it's important that we use complexity for a structural property and difficulty for the interaction between the structure and a human being. And finally, sometimes 
complexity is also described in developmental terms. So uh, something is said to be more complex if it appears later in first or second language acquisition. And for this, I propose to speak of development. So this is developed. It's not more or less complexity. It's more or less a, a more or less developed linguistic system. The problems with polysemy are like this. If you retain, if you three meanings for complexity, you assign complexity three meanings, you end up saying things like complex structures are often more complex and complex. Whereas if you just use a, a different terminology, you say the much more perspicuous complex structures are often more difficult and acquire late. Or you can say this structure is complex because it is complex and complex. Uh, that can be translated into this structure is acquired late because it is complex and difficult. OK, so it's just a terminological reform and I'm not proposing a new theory. I'm proposing a new terminology in the, in the interest of developing theories and uh, in order to avoid this discomforting result that we get sometimes after 10 years, 15 years, people concluding that mm, research accumulated so far is really inconclusive, etc. Um, if we if we use an appropriate terminology, it is clear what we are looking at and the interactions between these different constructs, because it's difficult to look at the interaction of constructs between and among constructs when they are all called by the same name. You know, what is your research question? Are complex structures more complex or so a structural definition of complexity is the number and variety of an item's constituent elements and the elaborateness of their interrelational structure. This is a much quoted uh, passage by, by Rescher in his book on uh, philosophical, the philosophical approaches to complexity. So intuitively, one would say that this structure here is less complex than this structure here. It's, it's, it's computable. It, it, there are mathematical definitions of complexity, and so you can measure complexity accurately in a very simple abstract system like dots and lines. What about language? In linguistics, this is an article I'm writing with Bram Boulte and uh, Alex Sausen, so it's work in progress, uh, but I, I'm going to take some passages, but also some ideas from our joint reflection. We've been thinking about this, these things for, for years now. So in our definition, language complexity is structural complexity. That is the quantity and variety of linguistic components of the and of the relationships between them. These components are linguistic items resulting from linguistic description or analysis. So if you take this purely structural definition of complexity, one of the implications is that you can compute complexity without looking at human beings. It's a relatively strong claim, but it's clear. So in order to compute complexity, you look at text, you look at structures, you look at grammars if you want, but you, you don't need to carry out psycholinguistic uh, research. You don't need to gather text, et cetera, et cetera, in order to define complexity. You can apply the complexity notion, of course, to people clicking buttons, reading text, producing text, et cetera. But those behaviors are not part of the definition of complex. It has to do with linguistic theory and description. Of course, this is open to debate. Right? I hope we have time to, to discuss all these things. Now, let's make clear what is often called complexity, but it isn't. So how to tease apart complexity from, some, from something else? And I will start uh, from some definitions, OK? So again, in, in this uh, contribution I'm uh, proposing with my colleagues, we define complexity, as I said, in terms of structural characteristics of linguistic structures and text. We define difficulty as the cognitive demands that these linguistic objects place on human users. So linguistics is a uh, difficulty, is the interaction between the linguistic structures and human users. So if you're looking at that, we propose to speak of difficulty. Development are the changes over time of these linguistic systems. OK, so development has a temporal dimension in it, whereas complexity doesn't and, uh, and difficulty uh, doesn't either. Whereas development has to do with time, so what changes over time. And finally, proficiency, which is sometimes used in relationship to complexity, 
as we saw in uh, one of the talks yesterday uh, about language testing, for example. So defining proficiencies sometimes sometimes involved using the term complexity. We define com proficiency as a language learner or user's ability to use linguistic structures for a range of communicative goals. So proficiency includes a communicative dimension, effectiveness, efficacy, uh, functionality. This has to do with proficiency. So if we represent these four different constructs by four different names rather than calling them all complex, then it becomes clear how we can study their relationships. So let's start by teasing apart complexity and difficulty. Uh, some authors call, uh, speak of agent related complexity. And then they add that this is the difficulty or cost and demandingness. Then why you calling it complexity with a modifier rather than just calling it difficulty, cost and demand. OK, Mr. Mo calls this relative complexity, opposing it to absolute complexity. That is the structural complexity. But again, that is using the same term for different constant. It's I think we all agree that difficulty reflects complexity. There is a clear directionality. Complexity may cause some difficulty, but it's not the difficulty for me as a human being that makes the world more or less complex. If the word is more or less complex, that may cause me some more or less difficulty. But there's a clear directionality here. So structural complexity and cognitive difficulty may often be correlated in practice. So there may be perhaps strong uh, um, empirical relationships between complexity and difficulty. But this is one more reason for not calling them by the same name. But otherwise, like once again, you say that complexity causes complexity. Uh, other terms that uh, are used are difficulty, sophistication, and I would say that uh, these are not complexity. And Nate, uh, yes, that's a little bit here in his year because I've been saying these things for some years now. Uh, Ortega gave this definition uh, in uh, 2003 stating that the range, complexity is the range of forms that surface in language production and the degree of sophistication of such forms, which was echoed by Paco sometime later, almost verbatim, by saying that phraseological complexity is defined as the range of phraseological units that surface in language production and the degree of sophistication of such regions. So it's virtually exactly the same quote, just changing um, phraseological uh, units for you know, adding phraseological units. My question has always been, what is a sophisticated form? I think sophistication is a um, rather naive term, I would say it's a pre theoretic term. Uh, again, in, in ordinary language, we use it all the time, but if we do research, it has never been really clear to me what we mean by sophistication. And in different studies, sophistication is interpreted as rarity, or well chosen forms, or chosen that are difficult, that is hard to master, or something that is learned later that is sophisticated, or maybe even something that is structurally complex. So again, sophistication cannot be an answer to this question unless sophistication is defined in, in clear terms, and then but then we, all, we already have all those alternative terms. So if by sophistication you mean frequency and rarity, then speak of frequency. If by uh, sophistication you mean difficulty, then speak of difficulty. And sophistication bundles too many of these uh, meanings together. Frequency, as I was saying, frequency is all, uh, also used as a proxy for sophistication, and in turn, this is used as a proxy for complexity. <clears throat> but frequency in the input, okay, it's certainly an important factor for explaining why some structures are learned before others. So frequency is an important factor. Again, I'm proposing not to ascribe this to complexity, but rather to difficulty, to learning difficulty. So uh, a rare word like tar is certainly more difficult to acquire because we don't encounter it in the input as frequently as car. But in terms of structural complexity, they are equally complex. Then you may say you, you may add some further information, for example, the frequency in the input, which is certainly relevant to explain uh, how they, they, they get acquired. 
but I wouldn't confuse these different levels by calling them all complex. And finally, development. Some authors like uh, uh, Rodellis say that complexity is the capacity to use more advanced language or complexity is defined as L2 acquisition difficulty or outsider complexity, so complexity for someone else. OK, again, if we build development into the definition of complexity, then the finding that complexity grows over time is a tautology. It's obvious if more complex is more developed, it must be that more uh, as you, you know, as time goes by, things become more complex. And, and, and again, this is building you know, the, the, the independent and the depend, dependent variable together into the same term. Um, so, um, something happened with the formatting here, but oh, this, this sentence should be in the blue box. A structure appears at a certain time in a developmental sequence. Okay, so this is the, the fact to explain. This is the observable fact. We notice that with some regularity, with some systematicity, some structures, let's say uh, third person singular S, tend to appear late in interlanguage development English as a second language. Okay, this is the observable fact. And why is it so? We can say because the structure is more or less useful. We can say because the structure is more or less frequent, or we can say <clears throat> that the structure is more or less difficult to process. Okay. And if we choose the interpretation that difficulty is a possible explanation for development, then complexity might be a possible explanation for difficulty. Okay, so complexity explains difficulty and difficulty explains development. There's a clear directionality here. And if we use different terms, we can start research. Pro and it might be so, of course, I'm not saying it is so. It might be completely false. There's no relationship whatsoever between complexity and difficulty. Fine, that is a fine. That is saying in 10 years time, if we systematically don't find any relationship between structural complexity and cognitive difficulty, um, fine. I mean, th that's going to be a finding. It's not an inconclusive result. It, it is a very conclusive result. There is no relationship like that. Yes, so that's uh, yesterday, for example, sociological complexity and something else. Uh, that's one possibility. There is no relationship, but you know, if the methodology is clear, then even a, a result like this, that no correlation is very valid and very useful. Um, let me spend a few words about validity. Sometimes we speak of validating complexity measures. So what is a valid complexity uh, measure? Some authors, uh, like the ones I, I cite here, propose to validate complexity measures by looking at how they correlate with development. So a measure is valid if it uh, uh, changes over time. OK, if it shows some developmental pattern. So, well, I won't, I won't read the quotes, but I, I leave them for yourself. I can have to share the slides. The validity of complexity resides in whether or not it correlates with the psychological reality. OK, so a measure is valid. It follows a progression. It's not valid if it doesn't. You know. uh, well, I, I beg to disagree because. Sorry. Um, this one I, I can't quote by heart, that's <laughs> too long. What, what, what I wanted to say is that structural complexity is a descriptive notion, okay? It's a measure, like length. You don't validate length, uh, you know, how do you validate length? You can use length for many theories, for example, the relationship between heat and the length of objects, uh, and you can have a theory there, you can make falsifiable statements there, but you don't validate things. It's uh, an observable attribute in the terms of Kane. Kane distinguishes between observable attributes and theoretical constants. So complexity, and this is again another controversial statement, is an observable attribute, by opinion. It's not a theoretical constant. You can build all possible theories about complexity and difficulty, about complexity and development, about uh, what are the effects of complexity. All those are theoretical statements and those can be 
valid or unvalid, it's false or true, etc. But complexity, if it's sort of primitive notion, it's one of the basic measuring units. You don't validate measuring units unless you, you say they are practically useful. That's a different sense of validation. OK, let's talk about different levels of linguistic complexity and give some examples. Starting from linguistic system to individual linguistic forms, text and multi word expressions, which I haven't really worked on myself, but we're struggling with the complexity of multi word expression and the Bramble Ken and Alex Sousa. So I'd be very happy to hear your opinion on this. So at the level of linguistic systems like German, Italian, is German more complex than Italian? OK, a whole linguistic system. This is a question that was taboo for many, many years. There was this uh, dogma of uh, equal complexity. All linguistic systems are the same, are equally complex. And past 20, 30 years, the, the let's say the dogma has been questioned, beginning with Creolists. So Creolists would say that, come on, it's true. Creoles are simple languages. We can say it. We're not <laughs> offending anybody by saying that uh, a Creole is simpler than Polish, OK? And uh, under many, many measures, it's not that, you know, it's uh, it's simpler in morphology, but it's more complicated in no, They are really simpler. So and, and, and so there are attempts in typological linguistics, for example, to measure the complexity of subsystems like the verb system or uh, noun agreement and you know, defined phenomena or even the whole linguistic system, although it's difficult. Yesterday we had Bianati and Brazolin speak of um, they say that the writer is the system. So the, it, it's true. I mean, each one of us has their own linguistic system in their head. We all have these idios idiolects uh, in our head. So in theory, it's true that we are what we are after are the systems. So we would like to reconstruct the system in somebody's head and say his or her linguistic system is more complex than that. It's more complex now than it was six months ago and things like that. Yes, that's. You know, that's the ideal, but in practice, what we have are texts. We don't see the system. It's hard enough to describe the system even for a, a big standard national language like Polish or German or Italian. And, you know, boundaries of the system sometimes are fuzzy and, and we discuss whether it belongs to the standard or not, but still it's uh, approximable. But uh, a person system, I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just say it's very challenging. So. If, if you think about it, we all measure the complexity of the text produced by, by learners, and from that we infer something about the system, their lexical system, their syntactic system. Okay. We can say, going to the opposite end, we can say that an individual linguistic form is more or less complex than another. That is possible. For example, in the lexicon, we could count the number of phonemes or letters. So that we could say that the lexical item cat is less complex than the lexical item procrastinate. So in morphology, taking a classic example for, from Turkish, you know, there are some words that are morphologically more complex. It's difficult here, you know, to count the number of morphological processes in a word. So in order to say that one word, one inflected form is more complex than another, you need to have a way of calculating the number of morphological things in that object, which, which is a, another story, of course. But if you think you can do it, if you think that that is feasible, in principle, it is possible to compute the structural complexity of a, of a inflected form. Syntax that this has been more standard in research. You know, we say that uh, we like cats as simple as we all sentences simpler, syntactically simpler than uh, structure with many dependents and elaborate phases. So in this sense, we are measuring the complexity of individual linguistic forms. What about the complexity of texts? So on the one hand, we can say that the text is complex if it contains a low or a high number of the complex linguistic structures we just defined. So if there are many linguistic structures that are complex, own right, then the text is more complex. Or another frequent measure of test complexity is based on the range of linguistic structure. And so all the TTR and its transformations, they are measures of text complexity. So they allow us to say 
that this text is more complex because the variety of elements in it, it's less, when a text is uh, less uh, repetitious, when a text is less monotonous, we say it's more complex because its internal structure as a text is more varied. Uh, finally, multi-word expressions. What, what I could gather from, from extant research in this area, I think that the problem is first to identify multi-word expressions in a text, and at this conference we saw that it's not always easy that, you know, pinpointing the, the, the multi-word expression, what is and what is not a multi-word expression is problematic in itself. So I think the first step should be this one. And then establish their complexity, probably with the same approach as the ones that I showed at the level of here of text complexity. So either establishing the complexity of each single multi-word expression, if there is a metric for saying this multi-word expression is more or less complex than that, and I was talking with Stefania about this, for example. So they are trying to develop metrics to establish that this multi-word expression is more complex than that, or using some, again, the TTR logic, so the diversity, a text containing more diverse multi-word expression. I would say that most research that I know of dealing with phraseological complexity has actually been involved with development and proficiency, not with complexity. So there's a lot of very interesting, valuable research about how multi-word expressions develop over time, um, how they are more or less related to proficiency ratings, and this is very interesting. I wouldn't say that has to do with complexity in my definition. OK, um, one of the one of the most systematic results of research in this area is that frequent multi word expressions tend to be used by more advanced learners and which is a bit paradoxical given what we normally know about difficulty. Normally uh, frequency predicts lower difficulty. And in this case, it seems to predict the opposite. I would have my explanation for this phenomenon, but I don't have time to enter here to enter an area that is not my own. But this is certainly something uh, open for discussion. And finally, uh, I propose to differentiate between grammatical and stylistic complexity. Grammatical complexity, using very traditional terminology, has to do with the complexity of grammatical roots whether you like or use the term or not, but it's a, it, it's obligatory complexity. It's a complexity that you have to follow if you if you want to speak and write grammatically. So, for example, the rules for constructing subordinate clauses in German are more complex, so they imply a higher number of constraints and obligations, etc., than for English. And this is obligatory. So, if you want to make a correct German subordinate clause that you have to abide by those rules. Whereas stylistic complexity has to do with preferences. They can be rhetorical preferences shared by a community. But for example, how many subordinate clauses are used in a text? You know, the subordination ratio, how much hypotaxis is used in a text? It's not a matter of grammar. It can be more preferred in German than in English. Okay, that's an empirical finding. That's certainly a, a stylistic or rhetorical uh, preference, which we all need to learn if we want to speak in a rhetorically appropriate way, but it has more to do with choice. It's not wrong if I create a, an English test using sort of the German syntax, uh, the, the German preference for subordination. It's not a wrong text in English. It might be utterly inappropriate, but uh, it's not wrong. So the question is, what about the bottom band, but where do phraseological phenomena belong here? Do they have to do with grammatical complexity, with stylistic complexity? Both. I would be inclined to say that would be inclined to say that they have more to do with stylistic complexity. Uh, but that that too would be open for a debate. Second and last part: interpreting complexity. Now having discussed how complexity can be defined and measured, then we get these measures, hopefully more coherent uh, uh, measures of uh, uh, narrower construct. And then the question, what do we do with them? How do we interpret them? A frequent assumption is that the more the better. So more complexity is better. Better text, the more advanced, 
more developed. And there are indeed many studies showing this, that more advanced learners as children grow, as L2 learners spend more time on the language, their systems tend to become more uh, complex. Okay. For many teachers, writing complex language is a pedagogic objective. So it would seem that the more the better. But is this always the case? No, <laughs> of course. There are several studies questioning the more the better assumption, and I will just review a few of them. Uh, Douglas Biber is probably one of the most famous for having challenged this assumption that, you know, complexity grows over time in a series of studies. He questioned the assumption present in so much uh, second language acquisition research that, you know, more subordination is more complexity. As I said, some, in some studies, all complexity was equated with subordination ratio. And he showed that, for example, in English academic prose, uh, more advanced, more proficient users, they use actually less subordination. What is more complex is a different form of complexity, this complexity at the level of the noun phrase. Or I can think of all the studies showing that, again, counting subordinate clauses is too coarse grained because there are different subordinate clauses. So initially, learners, both L1 and L2 learners, initially they tend uh, to use nominal clauses a lot, and then as they progress, they tend to use more relative and adverbial clauses. So it's not the subordination rate that changes because that remains constant. But what changes are the different types of syntactic construction. So it's not more complexity, but different complexity. Um, I particularly like a study by Crossley, Crossley and colleagues showing that younger L1 writers and also those receiving lower quality scores tend to use more cohesive devices. So we normally teach at school, use cohesive device, use connectives, you know, fill up your text with connects. Well, it seems that uh, so many connectives are actually an index of low proficiency. So in that case, decomplexifying your connecting range leads you to uh, more proficiency and probably more. It's, it's a consequence of more development. Um, uh, Phil Durant uh, and colleagues showed, for example, that younger and one children, they do use complex language in the sense, for example, of rare uh, forms, low frequency nouns, but they tend to repeat them more often. So on the one hand, it's more complex. On the other one, it's less complex. So in, in their data, development over time is a matter of different complexity, not just more complexity. Um, at this conference, for example, in the talks by Chites and colleagues, we, we listen, I, I paraphrase their, their, their findings, but what I understood is that the main finding was that multi-word expression, diversity and sophistication do not change across proficiency levels. And this was seen as a disappointing result, but it's just a result. Perhaps uh, a possible interpretation was what changes is their frequency. So it's not a sophistication and diversity, but maybe that other type of complexity. That is how frequent they are in a reference corpus. So that may be the aspect that changes. Over time. Or Lienko Simanka, she said, and these are her verbatim words that I described yesterday. This study, unfortunately, doesn't show any relationship between measures of phraseological complexity and essay scores. I would say this, it's not fortunate nor unfortunate, actually. I, I, I think that our values, the 0, 0.00, are wonderful values because they very clearly show that there is no relationship. This is a conclusive result, you know. So in that case, it's not fortunate and important. We, we ex always expect to find relationship, but there may be cases in which there is no relationship between one construct and another. I'm not saying this is the last word on the matter, of course, but uh, it's a very important, interesting finding. It's, it's, uh, it's part of our research program. Some scholars even say that less complexity may be better. So going actually in the opposite direction, this is a theoretical speculation by Lambert and Cormos in 2014. It is frequently the case that expert speakers and writers express complex ideas more simply than novices. This is not due to the availability of linguistic resources, but rather to practice mastery in efficient and effective message formation. So sometimes efficient and effective messages are simple and they have to be so. 
these are the few studies I know of that um, empirically show that uh, uh, indeed in some cases more development, so becoming more proficient involved less complexity. Uh, Bottini and Lefol yesterday they they quoted one uh, paper they just submitted, and I like the title: "The more proficient the learners, the less sophisticated their L2 vocabulary." There's a question mark at the end, but I think that the data they showed yesterday they they seem to be rather clear in this direction that it is indeed possible that becoming more proficient. This was another dogma, you know, that uh, uh, the more proficient you become. The, the 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 more sophisticated your lexical work, it's not necessarily so. Lenko Simank again in her book uh, of a couple of years ago, she noticed that in some cases proficiency ratings were negatively associated to sophisticated vocabulary. She wrote that sophisticated words may not fit, and it's true in, in some genres and uh, uh, registers, of course, they they do not fit. I um, I recently published a study on telephone calls. And where again, I found that um, intermediate learners of Italian, the second language, they make telephone calls, they use very elaborate syntax. So there's many supporting it closely, which is inappropriate. If you look at native speakers and advanced learners, they use a much more snappy syntax, you know, short clauses, lots of in independent clauses. And, and that shows interaction of deficiency. It's good. In
special projection with a nice hybrid filter. Yeah. Oh, the YouTube <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you, Michelle. Sorry. So um, this is what uh, Paco uh, claimed um, in wh while she uh, while she was attempting for the first time to um, to define phraseological complexity, and it was um, around the same time as we were writing our grant proposal for this uh, grant application for this project. So we decided to investigate phraseological complexity because, because it was almost uninvestigated at that time and because it was a really uh, inspiring topic. It was really inspiring and it was really also really difficult and challenging. It was challenging um, on the side um, of phraseology because we already know, we already knew from previous research that uh, developing L2 collocational competence is a slow process that poses serious challenges, challenges to langu for language learners. And we already know that one of the biggest lexical challenges is the acquisition of collocations, the learning burden of collocations. So this is challenging for learners, but it's uh, also challenging for researchers. As we already know from previous research that phraseology is one of the of the two puzzles for linguistic theory, and we know that multi word expressions are a pain in the neck for NLP. Hmm? So uh, from the side of phraseology, it's really challenging, but it's also challenging uh, we heard uh, Gabriele uh, is also really challenging because we know from previous research that complexity still poses a number of theoretical and methodological problems, mainly due to its polysemy. And we know that we need for further conceptual clarification and operas operational refinement of L2 complexity constraints. And we also know that further research should consider measures behind diversity and sophistication. So, in light of all these elements, we chose to focus on physiological complexity, mainly because it's a construct made up of two phases, each of which is really, really challenging. So it was a really inspiring topic. And by the way, after three years, we think that the project has largely confirmed this, this claim. So what were the aims of the project? Um, well, the project had three broad aims. The first one was to create a new Italian learner corpus from exam data. Uh, this was because there are you learner, corp uh, learner corpora of Italian and all the learner corpora of Italian have some limitations. So we, we thought we needed uh, a new and hopefully better learner corpus of Italian. This is uh, the, the first basic uh, and broad aim. The second aim was to analyze the relationship between different phraseological measures in learner data in our corpus. Um, measures derived from corpora, so for example association measures and complexity measures, the two traditional uh, complexity measures, diversity and sophistication, and to integrate these measures with experimental measures recorded, recorded during eye-tracker tasks. So basically we try to integrate experimental and corpus-based measures. This was the second broad aim. And the third aim was to integrate results from the previous analysis into the fields of language teaching and test design. OK, it is clear that we adopted a mixed methods approach. So we, as I said, we try to integrate corpus based and psycholinguistic data, but also use of NLP techniques. 
with always this uh, application to pedagogical settings. Um, I don't want to spoil the next uh, presentation, so I will just um, I will just say very very few general thing uh, things about our results. We have created a corpus, the Celli corpus. Uh, we will talk about that in the next um, presentation, and we used exam data for the Celli corpus. We have made different studies um, using corpus and eye tracker bay, uh, eye trackers um, measures uh, data, and we have tried to investigate the mechanism at the root of L1 and L2 processing of collocations, and we have found that we have found support for lexical priming theory. We'll see that later. We have also investigated the role of proficiency in the processing of collocations. And we, not, surpri not surprisingly, maybe, we have found not nonlinear patterns in L2 acquisition of, of collocations. And we have also found that uh, surface scales can be problematic. Uh, we have also investigated the possibility of integrating corpus and eye tracking data in the analysis of phraseological complexity. And we have um, detected the need for further investigation into phraseological complexity measures, which is not new, not new of course, but we have some evidence of that. Uh, other results, we have created a phraseological oriented language learning syllabus with different sections corresponding to different proficiency levels. And we have also created, developed a syllabus based phraseological knowledge test. Then this is the pedagogical part. Okay. And finally, we have developed a pipeline based on NLP tools for the extraction and computation of the phraseological units from past learner data. Uh, in the next session, there will be three next three sessions um, describing project results. The first one will be on the Celli corpus and on the analysis of learner phraseology. The second one uh, will be on syllabus and test development, evaluation of phraseological competence, and the final one will be on computational structure and extraction computation of the phraseological units and uh, the three uh, units of our project. So this is a list of uh, all the people, in, all the researchers involved in the project divided by uh, research unit. Um, I would like to uh, address uh, specific and special words of gratitude to, to all of them, but of course time will not allow me. So I can only say uh, a huge, huge thank you to all of you. Uh, all of you who are here and all uh, to all those who are connected from anywhere in the world. Really, really thank you for your uh, cooperation, for your competence, for your enthusiasm and for your uh, dedication. And most of all, for your support in difficult times. Really, really thank you. And uh, a special thank you goes also to a specific person who, who is not here today, Francesca Malagnini who accepted to take on a difficult role in a difficult time. So I really thank you, Francesca Malagnini. OK, ce l'ho fatta. Grazie. Uh, so this is the first session on the 
project results. We will talk about the Celicopus analysis of learner phraseology, and this is the outline of this session. I will make a really, really brief introduction uh, to the Celicopus, and then Fabio Zanda will talk about Celi exams, text selection and uh, criteria, metadata and design, and linguistic annotation of the corpus. And then uh, Luciana Forti and Irene Fioravanti will talk about this integration of corpus and psycholinguistic data, and they will describe two specific studies we made, and then we will draw some conclusion. So, why a new learner corpus of Italian? Uh, learner corpora around the world, the, um, uh, which, which is um, maintained by uh, Université de Louvain, uh, lists eight written corpora of Italian, but there are not many, of course, but none of them meets both the very relevant criteria of reliable attribution of texts to proficiency levels, and possibility to create balanced subcorpora. Uh, so this lack of uh, these two combined criteria uh, led us to plan the creation of a new corpus, the Celi corpus, uh, which is a learner corpus uh, including more than 3000 texts. It's not a huge corpus. We hope it is a well-balanced and well-designed corpus. And we also hope it will be a very useful corpus. It's uh, available online to the scientific community. And it also contains rich metadata uh, pertaining to text, both text-related and learner-related variables. Fabio, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Stefania. So, thank you, Stefania. We talked about the Celi Corpus, but what is Celi in this Celi Corpus? So the CELI is, stands for Certificati di Conoscenza della Lingua Italiana, that is Italian Language Proficiency Certificates. It's CFR aligned high stakes proficiency exams. They are developed by the Center for Language Evaluation and Certification of the University for Foreigners of Perugia. The University for Foreigners of Perugia is also a full member of the Association of Language Testers in Europe. Uh, since 89 and <clears throat> they develop uh, different kinds in, in different formats of exams but today we are going to be seeing these uh, standard exams so they are developed from level A1 to C2 but for the purpose of this project we actually going to consider just the intermediate to advanced um exams so b1 b2 c1 and c2 what is the format of the shell exams well shell exams are di are divided into two main sections a written section and an oral section within the written section we have uh, several papers like reading writing use of italian and listening um if we take writing, we see that writing is composed by different written production tasks, which uh, we selected to uh, be included in the Celi Corpus. Uh, in fact, uh, candidates uh, that, uh, that take a Celi exams have to produce a certain number of, um, of uh, written productions. And what are the criteria that we use for the inclusion in the Shelley corpus of this uh, written text? Well, uh, candidates had to have passed the written production task. They had to have passed the whole exam session, all of the exam sections, and they had to have passed them in the same exam sessions. Um, this is uh, connected to 
what Stefania said before about the reliability of uh, provisions. So these are the tasks that we selected as we thought that they could be comparable. They are different according to the CFR level and especially they uh, um, um, candidates are asked to produce different a different word range texts. So in order to find a balanced corpus, we had to compile a different number of um, texts according to the level and we'll see how many in a little uh, in a little. Um, in total, we uh, compiled 64 different task assignments uh, for the chain problems. These are the wide selection metadata, a part of wide selection of metadata that were included in for each text. We have learner and task metadata such as ID, age, gender, nationality, CFR level, task ID, task type, task genre and also a series of score metadata exams, total score, total score ban, written section score, learner test score, and its subscore, vocabulary control score, grammatical accuracy score, social linguistic appropriate score, text coherence and cohesion score, and others. We cannot go into detail with all of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just focus in, in on one of them, just to give you a hint for the nationalities we had more than 85 different nationalities and here in the bar plot you can see the uh, most uh, represented ones. But uh, a, an article uh, can be found in Italian, can be found in the journal Italiano Lingua Due uh, for all of the details. So moving on to the design and balance, as said, this corpus um, um, is six a little bit over 600,000 tokens divided equally into four levels. But in order to reach 150,000 tokens for the B1 level, we had to include over 1,000 texts, over 800 for B2, over 500 for the C1 level, and over 400 for the C2 for a total of over 3,000 texts. This allowed us to have a balanced design, design in terms of, of tokens and a pseudo longitudinal design as each text was produced by a different level. But the balance of the Chile Corpus is not only uh, for tokens. It is also for, we try to build also a balance for scores attained by the candidates. For, for example, test score on average is 80% for in all uh, levels. The learners that wrote these texts also attained an average of 75% in the written section score and an average of 77% or on the exam total score, that is the written and the oral sections total score. Also, within this exam total score, we try to have balance in for the score bands. So when a, a candidate actually attain a certificate and attain a certain score, he he's also uh, uh, posed in a certain certain score band, being the C1, the lowest one, up to the A1. So they actually attain the certificate, but there are different levels within this uh, level. According to the total score, so it will be placed onto the score band C, B and A. And here we attain, we try to attain a certain balance also in terms of score bands. So each, tele, uh, of course, the uh, Chelly Corpus was post-tagged and lemmatized using tree tagger and an evaluation of this post-tagging onto learner data was, um, was uh, actually made and was very recently published in this article that you can find in Second Language Research Journal. It was also parsed. Chelly corpus was parsed, but this um, 
will be talked in detail uh, by our colleagues from the University of Perugia. And this parsing allowed the extraction of word combination that were used in a few studies that we'll see later, in some of the few studies that we'll see later. Okay, I'll leave the floor to Luciano for uh, and Irene for the studies. Thank you. So yes, building the Chalicopus was a very intense experience, but it represented just the first phase of um, our project because then we moved on to the heart of the project, which was actually trying to integrate corpus and psycholinguistic data. Of course, there are there is um, um, there are a lot of advantages in doing this because we can have a multifaceted um, view of a single phenomenon. And in our case, the phenomenon dealt with phraseology. Um, so of course, we can consider different kinds of corpus data, and we can consider different kinds of psycholinguistic data. Um, there are here on this slide, we've put a few studies that have addressed this um, opportunity, the opportunity of integrating different kinds of um, um, data. Um, so there has been a debate and uh, several proposals have been made uh, in the past few years. We started by integrating L1 um, corpus data uh, gleaned from a reference corpus, which we integrated with L1 and L2 eye tracking data. And we actually kept using psycholinguistic data derived from uh, eye tracking experiments. This was our first study, um, and that's why it's our exploratory study, um, because of course, we don't have too much time now to get into this, but um, when it comes to integrating different kinds of data, such as corpus data and psycholinguistic data, the methodological um, challenges are enormous, and actually the methodological choices that have to be made are very, very um, um, widespread. And that's why I highly recommend the articles that we cite in this short presentation, because they really uh, go into this, um, into the methodology of it all. Um, so in our exploratory study, we addressed these two research questions. So first, to what extent do lexical and grammatical modifications disrupt L1 and L2 processing of phraseological units? Of course, these questions draw on um, literature, psycholinguistic literature that has um, explored these um, similar questions in the past. Um, does proficiency affect L2 processing of typical and atypical phraseological units? So this is a study that is currently under review for uh, languages, so hopefully it will be available to read soon. Um, so how did we select the corpus based stimuli? We um, used um, the DGR, which is a dictionary of collocations, which was um, developed on the basis of a, a reference corpus for Italian. Um, we used three corpus based um, indices which are used in the DCI as well. So um, phrase frequency, uh, the number of occurrences in the reference corpus, usage, the product between phrase frequency and dispersion, and log dice, the association measure which expresses the tendency of two words to occur together. Um, by adopting these uh, three um, criteria, we selected 12 verb noun collocations. Um, how did we create the eye tracking stimuli? So, of course, these were our um, phraseological units of interest, but then we had to create the actual stimuli for the eye tracking experiment. So, we lexically manipulated six of the 12 collocations by modifying um, the verb. The verb in each collocation was substituted with a synonym. So, for example, in the collocation valere la pena, which means being worthwhile, um, we substituted the verb and we transformed this valere la pena into contare la pena, which means count plus worth, but it's actually um, a combination that is not attested in Italian. And that's what we wanted to get. We then um, grammatically um, inserted a disagreement, a grammatical um, issue, the gra uh, grammatical violation in another group of six collocations. Uh, we inserted an agreement error, uh, like in the following example. So, um, seguire la lezione, which means to follow the lesson. Um, we transformed it into seguire le lezione, 
lezione, which basically um, meant that we had the article in the plural instead of the singular. So that's how we created the um, grammatical agreements error. And then both original and modified collocations were embedded in context sentence that would be read um, by the uh, participants. How did we analyze the eye tracking data? So we um, inserted, we identified our area of interest, which was the whole collocation. So for example, we had these sentences that appeared on the screen one by one and were read by the participants in our study. So for example, we had, um, quando siamo in macchina è molto importante allacciare la cintura anche nei sedili posteriori. And allacciare la cintura was our area of interest. So it was the area where we collected all the eye tracking um, data that we were interested in. Um, and this means um, when we are in the car, it is very important to fasten the belt um, also in the back seats. Um, we considered two eye tracking uh, measures, which we uh, analyzed through mixed linear mixed effects models, um, number of fixations and total duration of fixations. And now on to the results with. Thank you, Luciana. And so what have we found? Uh, we found uh, a significant effect of stimuli manipulation on both number of fixations and total duration of fixation, which were the two late measures that we analyzed. So uh, lexically manipulated collocations were fixated more frequently than original collocations. And in a similar way, grammatically violated collocations were fixated more frequently than original collocations. but. Uh, lexical manipulated collocations affected the processing of collocations not only in terms of number of fixation, but also in terms of durations of fixations. So lexically manipulated collocations were fixated longer than original collocations. Uh, we found a significant interaction between proficiency and stimuli manipulation on number of fixations. Uh, specifically, we found a significant difference between native speakers and intermediate learners in how they fixated manipulated collocations. Um, native speakers fixated modified collocations less frequently than intermediate learners, and it was an unsurprising result. But we also found a significant difference between advanced learners and intermediate learners. Advanced learners and intermediate learners fixated uh, grammatically violated collocations in a similar way, but surprisingly, uh, advanced learners took more time in processing lexically manipulated collocations compared to intermediate learners. The interaction between proficiency and the type of manipulations affected also total duration of fixations. We found again a significant difference, be, difference between native speakers and uh, intermediate learners in how they processed lexically manipulated collocations. So native speakers took less time in processing lexically manipulated collocations compared to intermediate learners. And again, we found a significant difference difference also between advanced and intermediate learners. Advanced learners took more time in reading lexically manipulated collocations compared to intermediate learners. So uh, we carry out these exploratory studies addressing two research questions. The first one was to what extent lexical and grammatical modifications disrupt L1 and L2 processing of phraseological units. Um, lexical manipulate, manipulation affects the processing of collocations both in terms of number of fixations and reading times. On the contrary, grammatical violation affects the processing of collocations only in terms of number of fixations. So grammatical violations did not increase the reading times of the stimuli. The second research question was, does proficiency affect L2 processing of typical and atypical phraseological units? Yes, proficiency does affect 
they are through processing of typical and the typical collocations. Um, we found uh, significant differences in the processing of original collocations and modified collocations between intermediate learners and native speakers and between intermediate and advanced learners. But we did not find any difference in the processing of original and modified collocations between native speakers and advanced learners, which actually showed similar patterns in how they process original collocation and their modified counterparts. OK, so let's turn to uh, discuss the main findings of this exploratory study. So our results confirm the process advantage of typical collocations over to modified word pairs. And this process advantage can be explained in terms of the lexical priming theory. Uh, so lexical priming mechanisms um, uh, guide the processing of the online process of collocation. So uh, readers uh, are able to recognize a collocation during your live processing based on the primary relationship between collocation elements. So when a reader encounters the first element of, of a collocation, he or she is able to recall the second one. And uh, uh, modifying a collocation can disrupt uh, the lexical priming mechanisms during the online processing. Uh, and lexical manipulation and grammatical violation disrupt collocation processing, but in a different way. As we uh, saw earlier, uh, lexical manipulation affect the processing of collocations, both in terms of number of fixation and reading times. On the contrary, grammatical violation did not increase reading times of the modified collocations. Uh, this suggests that uh, uh, readers uh, noticed the grammatical uh, um, error between the two elements of the collocations, but they were able to recover quickly from, from the grammatical mismatch. On the contrary, lemma manipulation resulted to be more salient at the phrase level than grammatical incongruency. And proficiency uh, does modulate the processing of collocations. So, um, we found an interesting result uh, when we found that advanced learners took more time in processing lexically manipulated collocations compared to intermediate learners. Uh, this could be due on the fact that intermediate learners may be less aware than advanced learners about the lexical restriction between collocation elements, and they perceived um, modified, lexically modified collocation as more acceptable than uh, uh, advanced learners. But we did not find any difference between advanced learners and native speakers, which suggests that mechanisms at the root of L1 and L2 processing might be similar. This could be due on the fact that advanced learners may be more exposed to the second language and have had more experience with the, the target L2 than intermediate learners. So this is what we found with the exploratory study. And then we uh, we carry out a more ambitious uh, eye tracking purpose based study and I leave the floor to Luciana again. Yes, so after our exploratory study, we had to conduct our main study. So basically use the wonderful corpus that we created to conduct um, a psycholinguistic, uh, an eye tracking study using stimuli created from the corpus. So um, with exploratory study, we were able to see that L1 physiological units are psycholinguistically real for L2 learners. But what about L2 physiological units and what about their psycholinguistic reality for L2 learners? So we narrowed in on L2 um, learners, both from the prospect from the perspective of product and the perspective of um, processing. I need it. Um, so yes, we we basically wanted to integrate the L2 written corpus data from the Chali with L2 eye tracking data um, that had to be collected in a way so as to mirror the balanced design of the Chali corpus. So this was our first methodological um, challenge. The general aim was to explore the psycholinguistic reality of L2 corpus-based phraseological complexity measures across 
four different proficiency levels, integrating corpus-based and eye-tracking measures. We wanted to have a um, sort of psycho um, longitudinal perspective, thanks to the fact that the Chelly design um, contains four balanced subcorpora according to different proficiency levels. The research questions that we addressed were the following. Do phraseological diversity and sophistication affect the learner's processing of collocations? And the second one, does proficiency modulate the effect of phraseological diversity and sophistication? This is a study that we presented recently at the Euroslar conference and we're currently writing up. Method. So how did we select target collocations? So we wanted to use the Chelly corpus, but um, we had to work out how to do that. So we focused on uh, verb noun object collocations. We identified these um, collocations firstly by using a set of quantitative measures and related thresholds. So we considered frequency, of course, setting a threshold of two occurrences and our mutual information setting a, um, a threshold value of three. But this unfortunately wasn't, wasn't enough. Um, we needed to manually select the uh, collocations that were the outcome of the adoption of these two quantitative measures to make sure that the collocations in our list were true collocations. We then created four lists of true verb noun collocations that could be used for our study. Um, so we had a B1 list of verb noun collocations containing collocations such as condividere un'esperienza, to share an experience. A B2 list containing collocations such as allargare gli orizzonti, which means to broaden the horizons. A C1 list uh, with uh, collocations such as um, pagare le bollette, to pay the bills, and a C2 list containing collocations, um, in some cases highly idiomatic, like voltare pagina, which means to move on. How did we create, in this case, the eye tracking stimuli? So we created lists of target collocations according to um, a PMI. We selected um, 15 level specific collocations in three different PMI bands. So we identified a high PMI band, a medium one and a low one. So basically within each list, each level specific list, we selected 15 uh, verb noun object collocations from the high PMI band, 15 from the medium PMI band and 15 from the low PMI band. So this basically allowed us to have 45 level specific stimuli for uh, yes, each level. How did we calculate diversity and sophistication indices? This was another methodological um, hurdle that we discussed a lot. So very briefly here, we needed to transform text-based measures such as diversity um, and transform them into um, collocation based measures. So basically we needed um, to work out how each collocation contributed to the text diversity or um, and sophistication. Um, the design, um, we wanted to um, analyze the psycholinguistic underpinnings of each proficiency level. So we realized very quickly that we needed to construct four different eye tracking experiments, one for each level. So um, we placed each target collocation within um, context sentences. And then we added um, some uh, filler sentences, 45. So the sentence with a collocation would be something like alla fine ho prenotato il biglietto per andare in Giappone. I finally booked the ticket to go to Japan. And a sentence with a non-attested um, combination, so a filler sentence would be uh, riesco a parlare senza spostare le labbra durante gli esami. I can speak without moving the lips during the exams. It's a possible collocation, but it's not. it was not attested in our reference corpus. The design, how did we, um, um, yes, uh, analyze the eye tracking data? So we identified again the whole combination as our um, area of interest. The measures that we considered were um, first pass reading time and fixation count and total reading time. And now on to the results with Irene. Uh, the results show to us that uh, diversity index uh, affected early stages of processing. 
So during the uh, early comprehension processes, uh, learners took less time in reading collocation as their diversity index increased. On the contrary, sophistication index affects only late stages of processing. So in the late comprehension processes, learners took more time in reading more sophisticated collocations compared to the less sophisticated collocations. And we found uh, uh, a significant interaction only between the diversity index and the proficiency of learners in the late comprehension processes. On the contrary, sophistication index did not uh, interact with proficiency. So looking uh, more closely to the interaction between diversity index and proficiency on number of fix fixation, we found uh, uh, very different patterns between intermediate and advanced learners in how they were affected by the diversity index of collocations. B1 learners um, uh, fixated uh, collocations less frequently as their diversity index increased. On the contrary, B2 learners uh, fixated collocation more frequently as their diversity index increased. And C1 and C2 learners um, showed similar patterns in how they pros in the, how they fixated collocation, which vary in the degree of uh, uh, diversity index. Uh, looking now at the interaction between diversity and proficiency on total duration of fixation, we found again different patterns in how um, learners uh, uh, processed uh, collocations which differ in the degree of diversity. So B1 learners uh, took less time in processing collocation as their diversity index increased. On the contrary, B2 learners took more time in processing collocation as their diversity increased, but we found uh, a little difference between C1 and C2 learners in how they process collocation and how they were affected by the diversity index. So uh, the main findings of these studies are very complex and hard to interpret, but uh, we still work on it. And so let's turn to our research questions. The first research question was, do phraseological diversity and sophistication affect the learner's processing of collocations? Uh, they do. Uh, we found that diversity index uh, affected the early stages of processing, but and interacted with proficiency in the late stages of processing. On the contrary, sophistication affected only late comprehension processes and uh, it does not interact with proficiency. The second research question was, does proficiency modulate the effect of phraseological diversity and sophistication? Here, uh, we found very different behaviors between intermediate and advanced learners. Uh, specifically, B1 and B2 learners show very different behaviors as opposed to C1 and C2 learners, which actually show similar patterns in how they process collocations, which vary in the degree of sophistication and diversity. Um, so, uh, this suggests that uh, second language acquisition may be not based on a linear, there will not a linear development in second language acquisition, but it also, these results also suggest to us that maybe the distinction between uh, intermediate and advanced based on the self scale may be also problematic. Okay, so uh, I'll hand it over to Stefania for the conclusions. A few words to conclude this part of this first session on the on the project. Um, so what things we have done and lessons we have learned. Uh, things we have done, we have created a new resource for the study of learner Italian, the Telecopus, which is available to the scientific community, and that we have used to analyze learner phraseology. Uh, we tried to, from the methodological point of view, we, we try to integrate 
different approaches in the analysis of phraseological complexity, combining corpus and experimental data. And we found, we learned that this approach can be promising because it provides a broader picture of how some of the commonly used complexity measures, the two, the two main use complexity measures, interact with processing. And we uh, found um, in this interaction nonlinear patterns. We learned that it, it, it can be, it is really inspiring because it's, it is able to question the re reliability of CFR scale and of the current measure of phraseological complexity. And we also found that it's very challenging. Uh, combining different measures, text measure, for example, like diversity, uh, with item measures to be used in uh, psych psycholinguistic studies is really, really challenging. So uh, this was the main um, things we have done and learned in this first side of the project. And then I think we can stop here and ask for uh, wait for your questions and also for the coffee break with, which will follow your question thank you so much for listening I'm Thank you so much. That was um, a very nice presentation. I'm really uh, amazed by how much you've managed to do in such a short period of time. I have a couple of um, methodological questions, really quick ones. Um, I was wondering, and I might have asked this question earlier, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, in the first study, um, you included two late measures and also two measures that um, typically correlate highly. Um, could you remind me why the early measures or mid measures were not included and also why um, late measures, um, some later measures, uh, for example, rereading were not included that are typically used um, on materials that have some sort of violation and may result in rereading behaviors? Thank you, Anna, for your <laughs> for your questions. Um, so we uh, just focused on the late measures, tracking measure, uh, because uh, previous literature shown that uh, um, violation such as lexical manipulation may be more uh, we may be more detected in the late stages of processing than in the early stages of processing. But of course, it will be uh, absolutely interesting to investigate also early measure and. The this is one thing that we want to do. Uh, this was exploratory study, but we would like to extend it and look also at the early stages of processing. And thank you for your suggestion to considering uh, rereading as a late measure. We will uh, take it account. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and two super quick questions um, in addition. Um, you mentioned the threshold of two for frequency and three for MI in the second study, right? Um, was it um, the frequency of two in the learner corpus or in the reference corpus? In the learner corpus. In the learner corpus. Yes, in the second study, we extracted collocations from the Sally corpus. So we, uh, which it, it had the um, small dimension compared to a reference corpus mm -hmm. of Italian. So uh, we had to adjust mm -hmm. the thresholds of frequency and the sustation mm -hmm. measure, uh, which maybe are slow compared to the threshold use in studies which are based on L1 uh, mm -hmm. reference corpus. Um, so yes, and uh, we, uh, we use these uh, two thresholds in the Sally corpus. Based on the study corpus. Yeah. Did you have any threshold for the reference corpus? Uh, or it was all quite frequent and you didn't 
it didn't matter. Uh, we uh, we checked if they were tested mm -hmm. in the NL1 reference corpus, which was the Perugia corpus. Mm -hmm. Yes, we only look at they were tested in mm -hmm. uh, in Italian. Yeah, because. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Thank you. And um, I noticed in the second um, study, you, you looked at one area of interest, um, the whole phrase. I can't remember what was done in the first one, but I'm just wondering why you did not also look at the final word as an area, you know, an area of interest, which is very which is customary in um, multi-word expression processing research. Yes, yes, um, yes. This is an interesting uh, methodological issue. Uh, mm, well, we uh, wanted to uh, investigate if the index of diversity and sophistication um, affected the processing of collocations, which um, we thought that it, they were more linked to the whole collocation instead of the singular elements of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the collocations. And uh, we uh, we wanted to investigate uh, mm, if uh, the, the the two indices affected the processing of the world collocation. So we did not into account the last word uh, because also we did not modify the the, um, the first element of uh, of the collocations. We um, we inserted uh, in the filler sentences combination that were not tested in the in the reference corpus, and uh, yes, this is a methodological issue, and we we need to think about it more because we are we are very uh, struggling in the interpreting the results of this uh, this second study. But thank you for for this suggestion. Thank you very much. It's great, great. Any other questions? It's it's a naive question. It results probably from me being tired and absent-minded. But can you please explain again what the diversity index and sophistication are? Are you operationalized and measure them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We expected these questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was the most um, problematic part of our methodology. So we, <laughs> that's, why, that's, why we that's why we hide this slide from the presentation. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we uh, asked for help <laughs> from uh, a mat uh, mathematician. Uh, to uh, elaborate these two different index. So the aim was to transform the text-based measure in a collocation-based measure. So uh, we wanted to uh, have a, an index that tell us how each collocation contributes to the text diversity and sophistication. So to do so, um, we we yeah 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 so uh, the diversity index of uh, collocation C uh, has been uh, calculated uh, as you can see from the from the slide, which actually uh, takes into account the collocations, uh, considering them as tokens but also as types. Uh, and uh, mm, divide, divides this ratio uh, by the number of tasks in, in the subcorpus. So, for example, uh, in the our Sally corpus was made of four subcorpora: B1, B, B2, C1, and C2. So, for have uh, for having a diversity index of the collocation C that occurs in the subcorpus of the B1 level, we uh, had the information about um, how how uh, many times this collocation occurs in this subcorpus as a token, and how many times it occurs in this sub this subcorpus as a type, and then we divided this the ratio. Yeah. 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 
yeah, yeah, of course, it, it's always one. Yeah, we, we counted how many times as a token, but type, yes, of course, it's always one. Yeah, yeah yes, of course. Uh, and uh, and then we divide it by the text of uh, its uh, uh, its subcorpus. And on, and uh, uh, for the sophistication index of uh, a collocation C, we calculate it as, uh, uh, as you can see from the slide, um, subtracting the mean of the average PMI of each text uh, in which this, the collocation in questions occurs uh, by the standard deviation of the average PMI of each text in which the collocation C it occurs. So um, we we yes, the, the logic behind these two <laughs> indices is quite hard to under to understand, but um, theoretically we think that they could work. And um, but uh, as we said before, uh, I think that they were very hard to interpret it with the uh, results from the processing studies which and we are um, still work work on it yes is, is that of course the the difference of level uh, we have the text level diversity is at the text level of course but if we want to make a, uh, an experimental study we we needed uh, an, an item uh, measure not a text measure. If if you wanted to study the uh, the influence of uh, diversity on processing, we needed an item measure, and this is just uh, a tentative. Of course, it's a tentative. It's not nothing uh, final uh, at this stage, but it's a tentative of um, uh, extracting the weight of the single collocation, the single combination. Um, on on the on the score of diversity, which which is textual, okay? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we we think it, it could have a, a single diversity score, and it's just the the how much that combination contributes to the score of di diversity of the whole text. Uh, sorry. Only the sentence. Only the only the, the sentence with this um, with this item, and this was the problem. Because if, if we could if we could choose to uh, propose the full text, we we wouldn't need that, of course. But we chose to um, focus on the single combinations, and so we needed something. I know it's difficult. Uh, we know it's difficult. We discussed this uh, issue for months, <laughs> maybe more. Um, we tried this uh, solution. Uh, which is tentative, I, I repeat it. And uh, of course, I can understand your doubts and your... This question, um, even if we saw uh, a combination with a high diversity index, isolated, it wouldn't say anything because the value of diversity that we were able to attach through that uh, this formula to the single combination is a value that is related to the contribution of that combination to a text because diversity is a text based measure. So we can now retrieve some examples, but I'm not sure how clarifying that it would be um, because you wouldn't I mean, it, it, just by seeing it in an isolated way, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, yeah, that's actually that might be highly diverse because it's not an inherent property. It's a relational property. Sorry. Yeah. 
because because that's this is the criteria that we use to select the um, uh, the stimuli basically. So it's a stimuli that we were able to select according to this diversity index that we were able to uh, use to construct the eye tracking experiment. Um, we used uh, hopefully comparable as much as possible um, learner um, um, learner samples. So we had the level specific experiments. Um, so if so, this is this was our reasoning. If a combination that thanks to this formula is established as a diverse um, combination. Um, I mean, to what extent is that diverse combination processed um, easily or with difficulty? So is a combination used in the context of a corpus diverse if that combination contributes to the diversity? How is that? How is it then processed? I mean, we would assume that if it contributes highly to diversity, then um, it might be able to be processed more easily than other ones that are not highly diverse. But that was just our hypothesis because overall we wanted to um, explore the cognitive underpinnings of physiological complexity as a whole. And we considered the two dimensions that have been operationalized so far on the basis of corpus data. So, yeah, it's just an hypothesis. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> so thank you all of you because the work is amazing. I think it was a really good work and I think it's a, it's a, a great opportunity to have you here and discuss about it. So um, in your conclusion, you said that it was an inspiring work because it challenges the CFR scales. I would like you to explain in which sense do you think it challenges, the results challenge the CFR scales? Well, thank you, Danilo, for your question. And so first of all, uh, as you well know, <laughs> Um, in the CFR scales, there are few references to word combinations, first of all. And so having findings about these and seeing how important actually they are in, we'll see later in uh, acquisition and teaching, uh, we think is like a major flaw in the CFR descriptors at the moment. Um, OK, the new version uh, for the uh, companion volume actually mentioned a little bit more from level B2 upwards um, some importance on collocations and idiomatic expressions. Uh, but the point is, if you find like nonlinear results, how can they be described onto the CFR that is actually quite linear as a development. So yeah, it challenges this idea of becoming uh, more proficient at each level. At least the data that we found, other studies find. Then you have other studies that actually find like a linear um, progression. So this is a huge question. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely agree um, that phraseology does not figure prominently in the separate levels, but then um, it doesn't figure prominently um, in most major tests. Um, so it's not just CIFR, it's um, testing in general. Uh, to pick example, so for example, in the uh, B1 subcorpus, uh, accettare una proposta, which is which means to accept a proposal, uh, had uh, has uh, a high diversity index. Um, while uh, scrivere un testo, so to write text, uh, had a low degree of diversity index.
And I just want to add something. These are texts produced under uh, Chelly examination conditions, so they are the product of tasks. So of course, the kind of diversity depends on the task. I'm not saying anything new, but um, if you um, log on to our um, CQP web platform and access the corpus, you'll actually see the list of tasks. There are, I think, for, uh, 64 tasks. Um, so that can probably help you also interpret how we, yeah, the, the outcome of the application of those um, formulas. So yeah, the examples that Irene provided, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure how enlightening they are, but they probably say more about task effects than the diversity index. Okay. Um, yes, we wanted to make it homogeneous because, of course, we had a lesser need in the case of sophistication because um, we didn't have the same issue as diversity. We just wanted to have a balanced measure that would be closer to what we had done with diversity, so to sort of weigh it out a bit more. But yeah, it, it was less challenging. Yeah, I think we can go on to the coffee break. So thank you very much. And yeah. OK, I think we're ready to start our final session which will deal with the um, application side of our project. So we started talking about our project by presenting the Celli corpus that we built. Then we presented the um, psycholinguistic ex experiments that we conducted. Now starts the phase where we try to apply what we found in the previous studies and um, after we constructed the Celli corpus in terms of um, pedagogical um, um, resources. So this presentation is entitled um, Syllabus and Test Development in the Evaluation of Phraseological Competence. We have our colleagues from Sapienza University of Rome um, that will present this part of the project. So I'll leave the floor to them and then they will be um, helped by also Fabio Zander who's here in the room. Thanks. Thank you Luciana. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our work within the framework of the third macro aim of the PRIM project, which as Stefania Spina said earlier, included in the develop and development of phraseological oriented language learning syllabus and a syllabus based phraseological knowledge test. First of all, I would like to thank our colleagues of University for Foreigners of Perugia University of Perugia Research Group and uh, Sapienza Research Group for these years of close work. In addition to Veronica D'Alessio, Francesca Larussa and Fabio Zanda who are presenting with me today, I'm pleased to mention uh, Sabine Elizabeth Kesters, Gensini, Anna Suadoni and Giada Gaudio who could not be present today, but whose contribution has been fundamental during these years of the Prim Frame project. Well, uh, please allow me to summarize the contents of today's report. This is a quick overview of our presentation and we will start from frame project goals. 
as foreseen in the work package six of the pre of the pre frame project, we would first deal with the learning and teaching collocations, designing a corpus based syllabus of Italian verb noun collocations and defining what method we used to select them. In the second part of the presentation, we will show final results, the path that led from the syllabus to the creation of the test, conclusions, limits, and future directions. So let's start with the aims. The definition of a measure of phraseological complexity will lead us to the creation of a phraseological syllabus for learning Italian. Until now, language teachers and trainers have relied exclusively on lexical syllabi based on the contextualized lists of words and grammatical syllabi based on uh, structures and functions to be learned at different stages of the learning process. However, a separation between syntax, vocabulary and communicative functions is artificial as it does not reflect the way language actually functions in, this, in its authentic production context. A sequence of, word, of words is able to inform us about all the levels we need to be able to learn that sequence. Corpus-based measurement and psycholinguistic data are able to inform us about how complex it is and what level of proficiency it should be assigned while qualitative analysis based on concordances are able to reveal uh, patterns of use related to context and gender related variables. Therefore, we propose to create a syllabus calibrated to each competence level in which phraseological units are, combi are combined with communicative functions. Thus, to recapitulate, the corpus-based measures identified through student data guided development, guided the development of a phraseology-oriented language learning syllabus with different sections corresponding to different levels of competence. In light of the syllabus and the CEFR levels, a phraseological competence test was developed. Now we move on to define the real core of this work package of the Prim Frame project, that is learning and teaching collocations. In fact, lexical combinations and thus collocations are central to language learning because they process it more quickly than free combinations. They are a sort of island of reliability, as Henriksen claims in 2017, on which learners can rely instead of constructing the, the message word by word. And they also increase uh, fluency in production as Nesselhoff states in 2005. Corpus-based research on collocations shows that acquiring a collocational competence is often a difficult and non-linear process, as we see to, before. As a matter of fact, the production uh, of collocations is a significant obstacle even for advanced learners. Their development in learners' interlanguage is low and often follows a U-shaped pattern. And compared to native speakers, learners tend to overuse a few very frequent collocations instead of using a wide range of different collocations. Moving to teaching, according to Lewis, teaching collocations should be a priority in language courses. However, unlike other phraseological units, e.g. Uh, idioms and proverbs, collocations are usually not emphasized in language courses, so students do not notice this and assimilate them as complex exams. As a matter of fact, in Italian L2 syllabi and profiles collocations do not have much space. For example, in the Italian language profile, we can find lexical lists of single words in alphabetical order for level from A1 to B2. And similarly, 
in the syllabus adopted by the official Italian L as L2 certifications. Again, mainly single words are given. Even though uh, it is not a syllabus or a profile, more space is given to collocation in the Dizionario delle Collocazioni Italiane per Apprendenti. There is a corpus-based dictionary of Italian collocations specifically targeted to learners. In the DCA by Stefania Spina 2016, collocations were extracted from the Perugia corpus, ordered by their coefficient of usage, uh, a measure that combines frequency and dispersion through textual genres, and assigned to the beginner proficiency level, taking into account also the topic they address to. In conclusion, if every language is formulaic in nature and a quiet collocation is particularly useful but also difficult for learners, it is crucial to draw their attention not only towards single words but towards combinations of words, aiming to develop collocational competence. A syllabus of Italian collocations could therefore be a useful resource for Italian L2 teachers. And here I give, my, I give the floor to my colleagues that will tell you more about the syllabus we designed. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Fran. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the actual design of the syllabus. First, we'll focus on the content selection. The first choice to be made concerns the reference corpus for the extractions of the collocations. One can either extract the collocations from a native speaker's corpus and then place in them on a proficiency scale mirroring the frequency in the native speaker's production, or the collocations can be extracted directly from a learner's corpus and thus placed at a given proficiency level following their occurrences in those productions. So, next. We went for the latter option mainly because, as stated in the English vocabulary profile as well, learner corpora provide reliable data on, learner, on the learner's authentic use of the language and shows direct evidence of when collocations begin to become part of their productive repertoire. Moreover, as we will see later, in selecting the viable collocations, we took into account conventionality as well. Given the nature and the scope of an L2 syllabus, we believe that certain combinations, uh, while not being strictly defined as collocations, may still be useful to the learners that approach a new language in everyday situations. Uh, our reference corpus is the Celi corpus that was presented earlier this morning. As we've seen, the Celi is made of four subcorpora, one for each proficiency level corresponding to the B1, B2, C1 and C2 of the Common European Framework. And the automatic extraction involved the three part of speech sequences, namely noun adjective, verb adverb and verb noun. We started building our syllabus from this last combination and originally the list included a rather wide range of verb noun sequences. We kept in the syllabus collocations such as prestare attenzione, pay attention, light verb constructions like fare colazione, have breakfast, and idioms, abbandonare la nave, which is the Italian for jump ship. Other combinations were instead removed, specifically, uh, specifically non-target-like combinations such as utilizzare attenzione for prestare attenzione, and free combinations like cercare la televisione, look for the TV, for example. This list uh, was then further filtered, combining object objective measures of association and frequency and phraseology, and phraseology judgments. First, to remove free combinations, we use the PMI, that is the pointwise mutual information, which measures the strength of the association between two words. Following Hudson and Stubbs, we interpret a PMI score of three or above, 
at a significant collocation threshold and therefore remove the, from the list of all the combinations with a PMI score below three. We also use the, the coefficient of usage in native speakers productions, having as a reference corpus uh, the PEC, which is, a, we, as uh, we have seen before, a native corpus um, in order to remove non-target light combinations. Um, following SPINA 2016, all combinations scoring below two were taken off from the list. Finally, five linguists revised the entire list and made a decision on those combinations that cannot be strictly defined as collocations, but they are still highly conventional, such as Aprire la Porta, which is the Italian for open the door. This further step has been essential in keeping the syllabus learner-oriented, as such combinations are indeed very useful in real-life situations. Therefore, the final syllabus consists of a list of 945 verb noun sequences, namely collocations, highly conventional combinations, light verb constructions, and some idioms. Okay, um, let's move to the um, criteria and procedures that were adopted to assign uh, the collocations in the final list to the um, common European framework levels from B1 to C2. Um, in order to do that, um, several criteria were adopted, uh, but the main criteria were two. Uh, mm -hmm. The frequency of the collocation in native speakers production uh, and the number, um, the occurrences of the collocation in the Cherry subcorpora. As for the first uh, uh, criterion, uh, to account for the frequency, frequency of the collocation in um, native speakers' production, we took into account their coefficient of usage uh, in the Perugia corpus, and we made a distinction between collocations belonging to high, medium, or low frequency range. Collocations in the high frequency range uh, had to be assigned to level B1 or B2. Those in the medium frequency range um, should be assigned to level B2 or C1, and those in the low frequency, frequency range should be assigned to level C1 or C2. Um, in order to decide to which level uh, the collocations should be assigned, we also took into account uh, the second criterion, that is the number of occurrences of the collocation uh, in uh, uh, the cherry subcorpora, in learners' productions. Uh, so, uh, we assigned the collocation uh, to the level uh, where it occurs more often between the two proficiency levels indicated by the frequency range uh, that we just discussed. But sometimes uh, criteria 1 and 2 gave contrasting information, so uh, we needed to take into account two further criteria that are the Italian profile and the topic. Uh, as for the Italian profile, we checked uh, its lexical lists and we um, assigned, we identified the level um, to which the words that make up the collocation uh, belong. Uh, finally, we double checked if the collocations assigned to given proficiency level addressed topics that are relevant to that level uh, based on the information on uh, vocabulary range and control given by the Common European Framework. For example, we checked if the collocations assigned to level B1 uh, um, were uh, addressing topics like everyday life, work, job, um, and so on. Um, for each collocation, we described uh, its topic uh, following the, the Italian profile and its uh, classification uh, in um, specific and general notions. I will show you some example later. Um, however, uh, when uh, double checking uh, the correspondence between level and topic, uh, we realized that uh, often the distinction between C1 and C2 was arbitrary. So, we decided to merge the two levels, creating a single advanced level, a single level C. Um, this table sum summarizes the procedure uh, I just described. We might come back on it later if needed. 
uh, but I prefer to show you some examples to make the procedure clearer. The first example is trovare lavoro, find a job. Uh, it belongs to the high frequency band, so should be assigned to level B1 or B2. It's consistently used at level B1, 58 times, 39 at level B2, so it was assigned to level B1. The second example is avere diritto, have right to. It also belongs to the high frequency band, so it should be assigned to level B1 or B2. However, it is never used at level B1, it's used only five times at level B2, and it's used much more consistently at level C1 and C2, 40 times for C1, 20 times for C2. Uh, the word diritto uh, does not appear in the lexical list of the Italian profile that covers up to level B2, so we can assume that this word is learned at an advanced level. Also, the topic is socio-political structures. It's a topic that is more relevant for advanced learners. So the collocation was assigned to level C. Um, visitare città, the last example, visit a city, belongs to the medium frequency band. So should be, it should be assigned to level B2 or C1. Uh, it's already used 12 times at level B1, six at level B2, and seven times at level C1. Both visitare and città belong to the uh, A1 lexical list of the Italian profile, and also the topic relates to travel and everyday life. That is a topic that is relevant for level for intermediate learners. Uh, so the collocation was assigned to level B1. Coming to the final results, um, the syllabus, uh, the final list of the syllabus contains 945 collocations that are organized according to both proficiency level and topic. Um, as for the proficiency level, 221 collocations were assigned to level B1, 365 to level B2, and 358 to level C. Um, as for the topics, as I said before, uh, all the collocations were distributed among 76 topics, and the users can also search uh, for all the collocations uh, relating to a specific topic. I will show you an example in a minute. So this is the um, full list uh, of the syllabus um, that contains uh, on the first column the collocation, second column the level, the proficiency level at which it was assigned, and then uh, uh, the next two columns are for the topic. Those are all the collocations belonging to level B1. Next, we have all the collocations belonging to level B2 and the collocations belonging to level C. Here, uh, we have an example of how uh, we can search all the collocations uh, relating to a specific topic. Uh, we can use the search bar uh, on the top right and type the topic we are interested into. For example, I typed Tempo Libero, that is free time. So highlighted in green, we can see all the collocations uh, relating to uh, free time and entertainment in the syllabus. Uh, the last page um, is uh, um, for uh, the list of topics. Here we can find um, a list of all the topics addressed by the collocations in our syllabus and the domain they refer to. Uh, the syllabus is available on a website, Syllabo Collocazioni Italiane. Uh, if we have a quick look at the menu on the left, uh, we can see um, on the website, we can see the syllabus, the full syllabus, but also some information on the origins of the project, the research group, uh, the, um, how the syllabus was realized and organized, and some, also some ideas on future developments and limitations and some references. The syllabus also served as the basis for the creation of a phraseological test. Uh, that aimed at evaluating learners' ability to, make, to match um, the appropriate collocate to its base. For example, cercare to aiuto in the case of cercare aiuto, look for help. Um, it the test was in the format of filling the blanks with multiple choice. 
33 collocations for each level were randomly selected from the syllabus for a total of 99 items. Um, for each sentence, uh, for each collocation, uh, we uh, selected, uh, uh, um, we looked for the concordances uh, in the it scale corpus, uh, the Italian sketch engine learner corpus, that is specifically designed for learners of Italian. So the sentences were quite simple, um, so that comprehension uh, uh, shouldn't be a problem for test takers. Uh, the verb was removed from the sentence, and from each sentence, five um, and five options were given. The correct verb, uh, for example, in this case, cercare, one point. Uh, a verb that is semantically similar to the correct one, provare. A random verb, for example, aprire, open. Uh, a light verb, among dare, fare, prendere, mettere, or avere. And also the option, I don't know, uh, that the learner, the test taker can select if, uh, if they don't know the answer. Uh, because every answer was mandatory, so in order to complete the test, they had to answer all the questions. Uh, the multiple choice questions were also preceded by 12 questions aiming at gathering information about the informant's uh, profile, their age, native language, linguistic repertoire, and educational background in learning Italian. Uh, and this is an example of an item uh, choose the correct verb to complete the sentence. If you don't know the answer, choose I don't know. And here I give the floor to my colleague Fabio Zanda that will tell you about uh, test administration and uh, results. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Yes, here we conducted a study um, looking for basically two main uh, goals. So checking for reliability of the instruments, the test, 99 items that has been created and looking for some preliminary evidence of validity of this test. Uh, more accurately, these were the research questions. Is it possible for reliability? Is it possible to create a phraseological knowledge test that yields reliable scores in terms of internal consistency? Do test items show a satisfactory discriminatory power? And for validity, what evidence do test scores show in terms of internal construct validation? Is the test able to discriminate well between test takers of different proficiency levels? Uh, next, please. So our test administration administrations involve 103 Spanish speaking learners of uh, L2 Italian and their le uh, proficiency level ranged from B1 to C2 and they were recruited in Italian language and uh, courses at the University of Granada and Società Dante Alighieri of Granada. Um, so let's move on to the results. Main results in terms of reliability we find we found um, um, high level of internal consistency in the literature is considered quite maybe even excellent. Uh, 0.95 as in our in measure of uh, internal consistency, Cronbach's alpha. I also conducted a bias corrected bootstrap in a confidence interval procedure. That, uh, that repeats this procedure uh, 10,000 times. So we know that actually this value is with uh, between 0.93 and 0.96. So this 0.95 is actually uh, more accurate than uh, chance. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, item analysis, we conducted the analysis uh, using the instruments of classical test theory. And we found that on average, uh, the section of the of the test that is uh, composed by B1 items has an average item discrimination value of 0.39, the B2, B2 1.42, and the C1.40, which are again desirable results. Uh, next slide. Let's see for evidence of validity. Internal construct validation, we followed Henning 
Um, so, how about the discrimination power between groups of scores as test section? Uh, here we have three uh, groups, three sections. The average um, score for the B1 was almost 25 out of 33. For the B2 was a bit lower, 23.5, and for the C was 21.9. So we conducted a uh, within subject uh, analysis of uh, barrier parents, and we found we found um, statistically significant results with though a, a small effect size and postdoc tests confirmed that these uh, differences are between all pairs uh, with uh, 001 or p value of 001. In terms of discrimination power between groups of scores achieved by test takers with different proficiency levels, uh, actually the groups now are um, candidate groups, so B1 candidate, B2 test B2 candidates, and C candidates. You can see already here that the average is very different among the levels we conducted a non-parametric uh, non-parametric uh, analysis of variance with a cruise scale Wallace and the results gave a, um, a p value a very low p value with a large effect size and the postdoc test confirmed that they are actually all different between each other these groups so moving on to the last slide summing up Getting back to the research questions, is it possible to create a phraseological knowledge test that uses reliable scores in terms of internal consistency? Yes, we saw a Cronbach self of 0.95. And do test items show a satisfactory discriminatory power? Yes, they do, with 0.40 as an average. In terms of validity, actually, uh, first evidence of validity. Uh, we saw that uh, we have some evidence of uh, construct validation. We saw that um, it is easier. Uh, so they achieve a higher score in the B1 section, a lower score in the B2, and the lowest is for the C items. Lastly, is the test able to discriminate well between test takers of different proficiency levels? At least according to our sample, it is quite reliable in terms of um, discriminate between different proficiency levels. OK, I leave the floor to um, Maria again for conclusions. Thank you, Fabio. So coming to the conclusions. Uh, the syllabus was developed using both the Chelly Learning Corpus and the PEC Native Corpus. We compared learners' productions with natives' productions, checking that the collocations inserted in the syllabus are actually well represented in the language. The learner corpus provided evidence on the proficiency level of at which collocations become part of learners' productive repertoire, since productive skills usually follow receptive ones to identify the most appropriate proficiency level um, for each collocation we combined. Direct observation of the Celli corpus, uh, um, information about the frequency of collocation in native production, the exam of lexical lists of the Italian profile and the description of the topic to which the collocation refers. Considering that the exclusive use of empirical data does not allow taking into account some key elements in the attribution of a lexical element to a given proficiency level, as Spina states in 2016. Our methodology was also based on qualitative judgments. Of course, our work is not exempt from limitations. The first limit concerns the topic of the exam tasks that affect the type of collocations produced. 
The CELI exam includes tasks on a wide range of topics, but some topics are inevitably absent, while others are overrepresented, and so are the collocations related to those topics. If no task focuses, for example, on football uh, or on fashion or driving, art and so on, probably learners won't have produced any collocations relating to these topics and these collocations won't be included in the syllabus. The other main limitation is the absence of A-levels A due to the fact that the CELI corpus collects production corresponding to levels from B1 to C2, and this limit could be overcome in the future creating a reference corpus for the initial levels. Indeed, we believe that the use of corpora for educational purposes now represents an important resource both for researchers involved in the acquisition of second language and for teachers and learners within the learning path. Nonetheless, we hope that our syllabus and methodology adopted for its creation can be a starting point and a model for the creation of new syllabi that include collocations belonging to other syntactic patterns, now adjective, noun adjective or a verb adverb uh, or verb adverb or other types of phraseological units such as idioms and phrases. So before concluding, I refer you to the handout included in the project folder for the list of conference, uh, conferences uh, where we have presented the data and for the list of publications on this topic that have been published or that are in progress. Uh, on the same print of the handout, you will find the link to the website that Francesca Larussa showed a short while ago. And well, this is all on the next slide. Uh, on the next slide, you can find some of main uh, bibliographical references on the topic. And thank you for your attention. Comments from the audience. Can ask a, a very general question about um, you know it's a well discussed issue of course the, the border between collocations and free combinations and uh, just you know words that tend to be associated. Um, for example, what, one of the examples you made, uh, you said that you included some combinations that are not strictly speaking collocations, okay, which points to like a, a continuum. The difference from, and when you include a thing like visitare città, uh, would things like visitare Firenze, visitare Roma, visitare Venezia, would they be counted? Would they contribute to the to the to the score, to the frequency, to the mutual information score? Or uh, we're going into semantics, which of course is much more difficult to analyze with automatic tools. So, what, what were your your choices in this respect? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, it was um, a point on which we discussed it for weeks, I would say. Um, and all of us had different opinions on uh, um, when deciding if leaving them in the syllabus or removing them, eliminating them from the syllabus because they are not proper collocations. Um, the decision we made at the end was a, a rather pedagogical decision. Uh, we thought that since is a syllabus designed for teachers and also for learners, um, those um, combinations um, would still be useful for a learner to know. They, you can always find uh, them in a textbook. There is always the unit about uh, visitare città, visit the city. Um, also, knowing how to say open the door, aprire la porta, it, it's useful for a learner. So in the end, the decision we took was about was that of leaving them, since we had all the data about them in our, both in the CELI and in the PEC corpus, 
uh, leaving them for their utility for learners. Okay, so at a certain point, we stopped wondering if it's a collocation, it's not a collocation, should we leave it, should we remove it? And we said, okay, yes, we will uh, keep it in the syllabus because it might be useful for learners to know. This, this was our conclusion after weeks of discussion. <laughs> I don't know if my um, colleagues want to add anything on that. No. Questions? Questions? Comments? Com Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, interesting talk. I'm having a quite like naive and general question because I didn't get that right in the beginning. But so the purpose of your syllabus is to draw conclusions for teaching or is it to actually test the people? And do you think there is or should be a difference between the two things? OK, so we started. Uh, thank you for the, for your question. We started from the idea. Uh, we started from noticing that there is not in, in the main Italian uh, uh, syllabi and profiles, uh, not much space is given to collocations. We can find many lists of single words, but mm, not much space is given to collocations. So uh, our intention, our aim, uh, was to develop a syllabus for teaching, mainly for teaching, to give references for teaching collocations. Um, then at the end, uh, we also uh, thought about adding um, a test based on the syllabus that should come at the end of the teaching experience, of course. Uh, but our syllabus has not been tested in any class for the moment. We hope it might be in the future, but it has just been published. So uh, until now, no teacher has used it um, yet. Um, possibly we hope that in the future, some teachers might use it. Uh, and also they might also use the test that we developed as well uh, that is based uh, on the syllabus. Um, but yes, when starting the project, we wanted to create some useful reference uh, references for mainly for teachers and also for learners. Okay, great. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to ask what about the pedagogical sequencing of the syllabus? Um, is it, well, it's organized, of course, in, in, in terms of, of, of the levels, but um, uh, what else? Is it based on topics? Um, you mentioned that the issue of the topics, but is it also task based? Uh, how uh, can it teach it? Well, basically, teach these these collocations it's, it's always very difficult how to do it i mean one thing is a list of collocations but then in classroom practice how do you do it um yes uh, we just uh, really uh, linked collocations to level and topic uh, linking collocations to uh, the topic uh, we thought um, was very important um, 12 teacher put the collocations not only teach the collocations not only at the right level but also relating to uh, the right topic so it would help organizing a, a lesson of course uh, it would be useful if this syllabus could be uh, also uh, integrated in some textbooks uh, also in we have also looked at uh, textbooks uh, of Italian and how they deal with collocations and not many textbooks include collocations. Uh, um, it's not they, it's not clear at which level, um, what is the criterion to insert a given collocation at which level. So I, we think that our syllabus can also be useful for um, the author of textbook that can insert uh, the appropriate collocation at, the, at an appropriate level and linked to an appropriate topic. But of course, this is only, uh, this is just our 
op uh, and by now they are not uh, integrated they are not very well integrated in textbooks uh, they are not uh, um, related to tasks uh, it's an interesting point of course uh, we might need more time to <laughs> to do that i don't know if my colleagues want to add anything on that Okay, that's all we have time for. So let's thank our colleagues from Rome, Maria Roccaforte, Veronica D'Alesio and Francesca La Russa. And let's welcome the members of the third team of the project, um, the computer scientists. So Alfredo Milani, Valentina Franzoni, Giulio Biondi and Valentino so uh, Santucci, who is um, with us from another university building. So the floor is yours. I'll, I'll just kindly ask Francesca to stop sharing her screen. Or Veronica, whoever shared. Great, thanks. Yeah, if I can, just a few words. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Just a few words. I am sorry that uh, I was not able to be there. I am in the middle of a lesson now taking a short break. Unfortunately, I was not able to move neither the lesson nor the talk. Uh, by the way, I would like to say thanks to Stefania and uh, to Francesca too to let me be involved in a field which is not which was not the mine and it is still continue to be not the mine. <laughs> And uh, also to Alfred and my colleagues from uh, UniPG that uh, they will show you the aspect related to machine learning uh, regarding the project. And uh, thanks for everything. And I leave the floor to them. Thank you again. Great. Thanks, Valentino. OK, so welcome to everybody who arrived to this last final uh, intervention. OK, so I am Valentina Franzoni, one of the members, and I'm going basically to introduce my colleagues and the topics of which they will speak. So you already met Dr. Valentino Santucci from this university, but he previously worked in our department, so we are very close. And uh, for the others, here we are. Professor Alfredo Milani, Giulio Biondi, Valentina Franzonismi and Valentino Santucci. We have a bunch of other colleagues who participated from time to time, but we are uh, the ones that are present for this project. And uh, we spoke a lot about this project, so we won't introduce again the project, uh, the corpus, the syllabus, and so on, but we would like to give some contribution just for technical things. So a few technical uh, examples. We will go on very uh, quickly, so you can have, of course, uh, time to ask us anything that you would like to ask. But before, <laughs> I want to speak about uh, the collaboration, because what we got from this long five years, because there was a COVID inside and so it, it was a long collaboration, is that we speak different languages. <laughs> So we can speak about computer science as a, an L2 language for you. <laughs> so uh, how to focus on how to collaborate properly. So we are not technicians, so we don't focus only, of course, on the implementation. We can for sure contribute to other things 
And what we got from this collaboration is that at the beginning, we started collaborating when we understood that we could already give something else that was done by hand. So automating something that maybe you don't know that can be automated would be, of course, good for saving time at least. So if you have this uh, great opportunity to collaborate with a computer scientist, one of the first things that you could do is to share your goal, your data, which for us is the input, and your desired goal, which for us is the output that we should give. So, for example, if you have paper documents, you can scan them and automatically transcript with the OCR software. So you don't have to do anything by hand. Of course, I am joking about very trivial things, but just to give an example. And then we can brainstorm together. This was one of the most exciting things that we could do uh, in this project. Uh, because we have, of course, to understand it together how to formalize the problem. And then uh, for, for this conference, what I appreciated personally the most are some uh, interventions, some contribution by people who provided technical formalization. For example, sorry if I don't pronounce it uh, correctly, Agnetia. Uh, who, collaborate, who proposed her analysis of all the measures in her corpus, how they work, if they are statistically significant. This is a study that everybody should do before starting, because what's in the literature is not always good for another different corpus. And so it's important to make this preliminary analysis and then another intervention that I appreciated a lot is the one from Arianna and Paolo. In particular, Paolo, when you asked questions at, at the end, provided a very, very well done formalization of the problem. And if we start from a good formalization, we can for sure arrive to good results. But if we miss something even small in the formalization, we can do big mistakes. And uh, uh, he was very good, for instance, in focusing on the fact that for this kind of problem, the system is the person, the writer, and not the text. So some of the statistics that we may want to apply, we have to take in mind, to keep in mind that we have, are applying it to people. And also other things like uh, um, grading manually, uh, some, something, and uh, having one or more people to grade and to need to reach an agreement, which from the statistical point of view and from the objectivity point of view is very important. And we can also provide some tools to do these kind of things more easily. So when we brainstorm together and when we can formalize correctly the problem, we can um, let you know what computer science or even AI machine learning can do for you. Because it can happen that, okay, to go on, it, it, it can happen that you don't know that something exists and that we can do something automatically instead of spending a lot of time. And this is my, <laughs> my intervention for for this then of course uh, you have to trust us for the implementation because it's our job but then when we give you your results so our output it's up to you of course the interpretation okay so we can give you tools but then it's up to you to use those tools correctly because of course we don't know what you know about the topic. So let's go on. I want to give my little two cents about PMI. I unfortunately could not uh, follow all, all your 
a contribution because I have had lectures and also sorry for my pronunciation because until uh, one hour ago I was speaking to Chinese and I, I am getting a bit of accent uh, speaking on each syllable for to make me um, sound more understandable for them and maybe for you it's not. But my two cents on a PMI, if it's not already said by others, is that uh, being a conditional probability and for how it is constructed, it works very well when we have to understand the independence, but it doesn't work so well. We have, we have to understand the dependency. We have here some two extreme cases. You can see up uh, there the um, formalization of PMI and down you, you have the two opposite cases of perfect dependency and perfect independence. So for perfect dependency, you can see that the numerator goes to one and then the PMI will grow for rare W2, which is word two, the second term or see a single term. And that's why it's not so good for dependency when it goes closer to dependency. Instead, for independence is good. So you have to keep in mind that PMI is a very good measure of independence because the values near zero mean independency, but also that is a bad measure of dependence. So if you have the dependency of the frequency that depends on only a single term in the formula, then the results are not very accurate. And pairs of terms with a low frequency will obtain a higher score in general than pairs of terms with high frequency. Thus, the point was mutual information is not always as good for pair comparison because it depends on the frequency on which you are calculating them. And also, PMI can be used as a measure of semantic similarity, using it with the frequency on a big corpus like the web. We already did a lot of uh, studies about it, and so I remember um, the questions <laughs> about uh, if it's possible to have a single measure to measure something like sophistication, and uh, my personal response as a computer scientist, so without all your knowledge is maybe not. But we can have other measures, not in the phraseology, but in the semantic uh, area that can be used together to understand if, for instance, a term that appears a few times is sophisticated. Or is something that is like a slang or is a let's say a common mistake that can appear the same with the same frequency of a, of a sophisticated term. And now I am asking Giulio to come. Giulio will give you some more technical information. I leave here some references um, for finding us, finding us in our department, in our research group. So basically, Giulio will now explain you all the our workflow and some uh, technical details. But again, we will not go very in depth on these details. Feel free to ask and to stop us or ask later if you want more. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, being here now. Uh, we will explain uh, the workflow in our terms. Our colleagues already explained which were the steps of analysis of the data from the linguistic point of view. And here we show which were our steps. So the first step, which was actually the result of a, a fruitful interaction with uh, our fellow colleagues, was the phraseological units selection. The main selection was determined 
by the objectives of the project, but we had some more things to do, which we'll show you later. Then we had to select a parser. We have several tools available for the Italian language, not as many as for the English language, of course, but we had to choose between quite a few and we did some tests to uh, choose the most appropriate one for our project. Then after choosing the, our toolkit, we went through the text parsing and analysis phase where we took the text in the Celli corpus and asked them, analyzed them, and again, we will go more in detail later. We computed the frequencies of the single terms and of the phraseological units in the corpus. And then finally, we computed some uh, phraseology measures and the results when they give it to our colleagues, uh, as Valentina said, for further interpretation of the results. So, Let's start. You all know what's, what a phraseological unit is, so I won't go into detail here. Just we focused on two element units. OK, so two words connected by a dependency link. Which dependencies? It was always a matter of which, what to choose. Uh, the free direct object, adjective and modifier, and adverb and modifier were the ones chosen in the frame project for analysis. So we focused on candidate phraseological units uh, that were composed by two, uh, were composed of two words connected by one of these dependency links. And here you see three examples, one for each dependency. But of course, the list of dependencies is much longer. OK, here we see 45 different dependencies which can be found in the corpus. And after, again, long and fruitful discussions, we cut down some, some of them. OK, and uh, they were used as modifiers to give a, a wider context of the uh, to the phraseological units, but we will see it later more in detail. Again, which? Which parser? So we uh, restricted our choice to three different tools which were available at the time and now have further developed in the meantime. We have Tint, developed by the uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation, UDPipe, developed by the University of Formal and Applied Linguistics at the Charles University in Czech Republic, and Spacey another open source toolkit developed by Explosion.ai. They offer more or less the same fun functionalities. Uh, UDPipe has some in development, but those were not related to our project. So uh, for our project, the set of function functionalities was OK for all of them. Um, of course, they all offer the uh, main natural language processing functionalities, tokenization, syntax segmentation, lemmatization, and all the ones you can see here and more specific for the Italian language, because as we know, um, natural language processing tasks are highly language dependent. So the availability of specific tools is fundamental to perform uh, su successful analysis. Here we show a sample sentence taken from the corpus. And the first output is the tree visualization. Here you can see the dependency tree of the sentence as visualized by the different toolkits. All of them, so here the first one you see is from Spacey. The second one is from Tint. And the third one is from UDPipe. As you can see, all of them are highly informative, although they were not used for our automatic uh, processes, but they can give a hint of the sentence structure. And you can see the dependency links between the words and the uh, parts of speech. So speaking of dependency trees, all of them offer the functional functionality. What the uh, different the difference lies in the uh, accuracy 
of the toolkits at the time because well, we uh, observed experimentally that um, UD pipe and TINT had a higher accuracy in predicting the path of speech and the dependency links if compared to SPACI and the models available in the SPACI toolkit. Uh, for example, here you can see that the term proposte is correctly tagged as a verb from by UD pipe and TINT, but is incorrectly uh, tagged as a noun in the uh, SPACI toolkit. And we observe such kind of error frequently throughout the text. Speaking of the output format, uh, UD Pipe and Spacey output their data in the COMLLU format, which is based on universal dependencies, while tint in the JSON format. Considering all these aspects, we chose UD Pipe for its uh, advantages, namely quality, reliability, and the output format, which is a tabular format ready to be, uh, for example, imported into a database. UD pipe is based on the universal dependencies. There are several pre-trained models available for the Italian language, and because of its size and accuracy, we chose the ISDT model. Now there are 10 different models available. And it tags uh, terms according to 17 different parts of speech and 45 syntactic dependencies, the ones I showed you before. Which were selected as modifiers. So uh, we focused our analysis on the free dependencies I showed you before, and the modifiers are other words in the same sentence connected by a dependency link that is selected to give uh, a broader context of the sentence the phraseological unit or candidate phraseological unit lies in. So you can see the two words in green are the candidate phraseological unit and the words in blue are the modifiers. The modifiers were extracted according to uh, uh, an algorithm which simply scanned through the dependency links under the words that composed the phraseological unit and were then extracted again until the bottom of the dependency tree. And then were returned in an ordered manner and associated to the words. Speaking of the two aspects of the project, so sophistication and diversity, for the sophistication part, we uh, consider the two measures, so the PMI, which Valentina already very well explained, and the log dice measure, which focus on the uh, on different aspects. One is, is dependent on the size of the corpus, one is independent, but we computed uh, both of them for all the phraseological units. As a source of uh, statistics for the uh, frequency of terms, we use the Paisa corpus because the cherry corpus uh, is relatively small in size and specific, while we needed a broader base to have uh, uh, statistics. And so we resorted to the Paisa corpus, which is quite large actually. For the diversity part, we consider general diversity measures, so the TTR and its variations, and we also developed some uh, specific phraseological diversity measures, still based on the type token ratio, but where the terms in the fraction are the uh, words tagged in a text as dependent under a specific dependency link. So object, adverbial modifier or adjectival modifier, thus uh, developing six new uh, phraseological diversity measures specific for each, for each text. Of course, speaking about AI and computer science, one of the biggest problem that we share also with other researchers is the absence of data, right? But we have uh, another problem, for the problem. As computer scientists, we need machine readable data. Okay, structured 
data. So our contribution was also to produce a data set of structured data, uh, which was published in recently, the article you see here, uh, which should enable researchers hopefully to progress because as I already told you, the availability of data in the Italian language is much lower than the English language, of course. And we are still lucky because uh, other languages have even less data. So our contribution was that one also. We published the data set on two repositories, IEEE Dataport and Zenodo. The IEEE data port version will be also updated in the future as we add more uh, measures and more data. So the characteristics, of course, are the same of the Celli corpus from which uh, Rita derives. Uh, we have two corpora, the task assignments and the learning syntax, uh, which were classified according to the CHEF levels. And the data set can be used for the following uh, tasks. So text complexity classification, simplification, readability analysis, and hopefully uh, automatic performance evaluation or better teaching support. We are not excluding humans. That's not what AI does. We are just supporting it. So this is the size of the corpus. We have 3K documents, 3000 documents for the RITA data set and uh, uh, roughly 640,000 tokens. And on the other side, you can see the statistics for the PISA corpus from which we extracted the frequencies for this reason. So both the corpus corpuses were uh, passed and all those processes were executed on the two corpuses. And of course, doing it on a small corpus is pretty easy. But doing the same thing on a much broader corpus is not that easy, can be not that easy in terms of uh, computing power and of space, size of the data. And we decided to publish the data set in two versions one which is closer to the computer science view, so a relational tables CSV version, which means basically a database, a relational database in which we have 11 tables, which are linked of course, uh, by foreign key links and have this size. And another version, which is closer to uh, tools uh, uh, language researchers use every day, an XML version with the corresponding XSD schema, which can be used uh, basically uh, similarly to the other version because they contain the same information, but just structured in a different way. And that's all. <laughs> so now I will give the word to Professor Milani, who we will uh, just, just a few words about the automatic classification yeah. with machine learning and AI. OK, my my talk will be very, very, very quick, very short. I will recap some of the experiments we have done on the field of uh, automatic classification of just a moment okay automatic classification of l2 learners according to the cefr proficiency level as you as any many people have mentioned in this uh, in this conference of course we consider only the level encoded in Celi corpus b1 b2 c1 c2 and we have done a systematic comparison of classifier and uh, based on sophistication and diversity metrics so we have experimented different approaches i will uh, recap briefly we know exactly and we have defined it many times uh, 
many aspects of what, what is a selling corpus and what we have operated is supervised classification. So as a typically machine learning task, we have taken, we have a split part of the corpus in the so-called training set, and then we have used the, the other part, it's test set, to evaluate the performance of a classification algorithm. And there are also some open aspects that we are still working on. So as you know, the data set, the Selic corpus is uh, from the machine learning point of view is a little bit unbalanced. We have a much more, we have a 1,212 text on class B1, while class C2, the more, the, more, the highest class uh, is, uh, is represented by one third of the data. And these are some, mm, some aspects that you have to consider when you do a classification. And of course, as uh, Julio introduced before, we have considered this kind of a token, de de token dependencies and uh, phraseological measure based on these dependencies. This is the workflow we have uh, considered in our experimentation. We have considered different aspects of phraseological metrics, as you so what we will see explain immediately. We have used the Selic corpus to uh, generate a data set and the Paisa corpus, as uh, kindly uh, Julio mentioned before, to extract uh, the statistical figure to implement and to um, generate the the phraseological matrix. Then this as said for each phraseological aspect we have considered, we have generated the data set, we split the data set in training and test set, and we experimented about 12 classification algorithms and we analyzed the result. As I said before, we have considered diversity, sophistication in log dice aspect and PMI metrics. And we have classified basically, these are the 12 classification algorithms we have considered that are divided into uh, three main classes, uh, support vector machine, the first three, random forest, the second three, genie entropy log loss, multi-year per perception aspect and ens ensemble classifier like uh, quadratic, at a boost, uh, and IF based classifier. What have been the systematic experiment plan we have had? Basically, we have a first focus on a single aspect. How diversity only can help to classify text in the cell corpus. How sophistication in the PMI version can help to classification, how log dice feature can alone can help uh, classification. Then we have a focus on diversity and classification together. And that is at five and four was the experimentation done on this aspect. Let's go directly to the result. So basically, as you see the list of the different aspects, you see that the diversity and sophistication give a quite significant improvement that you arrive around 76% and 76% of accuracy with a maximum obtained by the lock dice approach. And is uh, worth to mention that uh, the previous best result in literature that was uh, obtained by a group of this university of uh, foreigners, it was obtaining an accuracy of 74%. And we were able happily to improve this result of about 2%. That is, classification is not, is not a little number, a little figure. I show you a comparison chart. The red line is the performance of the previous best accuracy that you see. 
the uh, first color is the diversity plus the pi, the second diversity plus pi mi. And you see basically as a general aspect that many many classification many classification algorithms overcome the previous best accuracy, but the group of subtle vector machine as a whole uh, exhibit best performance around 76 percent. There is another, and this is a quite uh, satisfactory result, but as I will say in a minute, uh, there will be even better promising result. One consideration about the data I showed you. This is um, a so-called confusion matrix. OK, confusion matrix of confusion that show you the classification in the different class. Basically, as you see, the best classes are B1 and C2. OK, while in class B2, you have uh, little performance, lesser performance. But there is one important thing I will I would like to point out it's the consistency. If you focus on misclassification elements, that means that the classification is consistent. Sorry, I don't have a question. The classification is consistent to be with the logic of the increasing complexity class from P1 to C2. And this aspect is verified by all table. This is not easy or automatic result in um, classification and also this this measure is the measure of the recall increase in recall and there is another metric which is accuracy and accuracy is also Over 1,000, in cases over 1,000. This is a basically, and this is comforting us very much for the result we have obtained. I conclude directly. The framework, as I show, promising uh, uh, show promising capability for assessing automatically. We have obtained best performance for. Uh, diversity plus sophistication and SVM algorithm. And we approved uh, previous results in the literature. We are doing ongoing work in particular of integration of these metrics, phraseological metrics, with more traditional lexical features. And uh, one open problem is uh, that we are working on is to consider composition of phraseological feature at sentence text level. We have a very well defined PMI to to specify the quality of a single phraseological unit, but when you consider a whole text, this is not a problem how to compact the contribution of the single phraseological unit to the classification of the whole test and technically also how to represent by a single number or by a sort of distribution. OK, a preliminary test obtained this very good result, uh, which are currently greater of 90 percent accuracy. Is that the contrast? Thank you. <laughs> Any comments or questions? For our computer scientist group. Yes. 
I have a hopefully quick question. Um, thank you very much for that work that you're doing, especially I think um, providing the resources that you're creating to the community is really a big service for all of us. So, so I'd like to express also my gratitude in that way. No, but I'm interested in the evaluation that you did between the parsers for Italian and there, especially if you evaluated them only on your target construction, so only on your collocations that you were looking at. And uh, secondly, if you also looked at uh, um, at how much the learner language that you were having impacted on the performance, so whether you also looked at the different proficiency levels and how the accuracy, the reliability would change there. So, thank you for your question. So uh, the evaluation was performed before even uh, diving into the corpora. OK, so we um, took the three part parsers and we uh, went through its parsing, uh, their parsing ability on the cherry corpus we had, and we observed empirically that the mistakes committed by one or the other parser were higher or lower. So we first we used the already trained models. Each of the tools offers pre-trained models, uh, which just need uh, to be applied to the data and used for inference. Uh, so uh, we did not do any analysis related to the uh, different complexities of the text, but ours was a qualitative, uh, qualitative, bah, okay, you got it, qualitative analysis on the uh, mistakes committed by one or the other parser. So that was the analysis we conducted. It was a preliminary analysis. Yeah, on the on the text of the Chali Corpus. Yeah. No, no, no. The teacher said that like only correct the ability of the parts so like three or uh, tagging adjective uh, type of tokens tagging etc. Yeah, there is. Yes. Yeah, now now the analysis can be repeated because in the meantime, all the models have been published and trained with different data or with new techniques. So uh, it's something that actually should be repeated again and maybe the results will, do, will be the same or maybe not. It's always developing, you know, so. But that was the. And that brings us to just the final moments of our conference. Just a few words on practical matters. If any of you needs a certificate of attendance or a certificate of presentation, just write us an email at the conference address. That is projectoframe at gmail.com. The same email address that you've used so far and we'll be happy to send them out. Uh, second piece of information, as you know, we will be publishing papers based on this conference. We'll let you know the details about that in due course, but not we, you won't have to wait for a very long time, so we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you, Luciana. Um, as you know, uh, roundtable was expected, but it's uh, seven past one, so maybe we can we can give it for done. I mean, we, we have discussed many, many, many topics and uh, it was not a round table, but it was a kind of a discussion. So I think if you agree, we, we can have lunch and, and go home. Uh, so uh, just let me thank you again for coming. Thank you for all your presentation, keynotes and um, contribution to this conference. It's been a pleasure to have you here and uh, thank you so much.